Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Fred Kagan. I am a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and the director of the Critical, Critical Threats Project uh, here at AEI. Um, we have a fantastic uh, couple of teams at the Critical Threats, Crit Critical Threats Project here that uh, work on Iran, uh, have been tracking that crisis and work on the global Salafi Jihadi movement. And I say that to emphasize, to clear up any false notions anyone might have that I am actually here at AEI and I don't work at ISW, even though I have the privilege of uh, working with and helping to mentor the ISW uh, Russia team. Thank you so much for joining us today. A year ago, Putin committed a terrible evil, invading uh, an innocent country illegally, unprovoked, that posed no threat to him. So it doesn't feel quite right to me to talk about an anniversary, even though it's technically correct. But also a year ago, the Ukrainian people began to show their own heroism and the strength of a free people. And that seems to me something worth commemorating. So I'm grateful to you all for coming uh, to listen to our fantastic panel. I should add, uh, we have two panels today. The first one will focus on the military situation uh, primarily and it forecasts. The second one will focus on the larger geostrategic issues. Uh, if you have questions relating to the larger geostrategic issues, please hold them for the second panel. If you don't, we will. Um, so if you don't hear a geostrategic question answered by this uh, panel, we will, we will take it for uh, the panel that is focused on that. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Kim Kagan. I'm a founder and president of the Institute for the Study of War, ISW, which celebrated its 15th anniversary last year. As the world continues to witness the devastating impact of armed conflict, the need for objective, real-time, and unbiased analysis has never been greater. And when decision makers need information from policymakers to humanitarian aid organizations to military leaders on the ground, time and time again they turn to the Institute for the Study of War. ISW has a unique dual mission, to provide real-time intelligence to help leaders make informed decisions in conflict zones around the world, and to educate the next generation of national security leaders. This work is carried out through the General Jack Keane Center for National Security and our General David H. Petraeus Center for Emerging Leaders. ISW is fully independent, a charitable nonprofit organization, and it takes no US or foreign government money. ISW is not affiliated with AEI, but we are so proud to have an active research project with this distinguished team and organization. ISW has published on the conflict in Ukraine since Russia first invaded in 2014. And one of the first people I met while launching that program, you'll meet in the second panel, the wonderful Natalia Bugayova, who is now a Russia fellow at ISW. ISW has also produced daily updates and maps of, Rus of Russia's full-scale uh, and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine for the past year. So uh, today, um, I, I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank the major print and broadcast news media around the world who have shared our work and made ISW the most mentioned think tank uh, in global media hits in 2022. ISW thought about preparing a printed compendium of our updates, our daily updates, uh, for this commemoration. But then we realized uh, that printed compendium would be 3,000 pages long. So we thought um, maybe we'll print uh, an atlas, a compendium of our maps, and that would be shorter and it'd be really nice, uh, but that was still 1,500 pages long. And so instead we decided that we should just host you this afternoon and talk about the war, uh, and it's a great pleasure to do so, and to do so with the team that has made this all happen. I really want to thank uh, this incredible team, the entire talented ISW team, but those especially on the stage. ISW Russia team lead and senior analyst Mason Clark, 
who, origina who originated the idea of the daily updates, uh, created its, the process, and just has led the team phenomenally this past year. ISW Russia analyst and geospatial team lead George Barros, who developed the methodology for our maps. ISW Russia analyst Katerina Stepanenko, uh, who is the lead uh, for our um, understanding of Russian information operations, Kremlin politics, uh, and mill bloggers. And ISW Russia analyst and Evans Hansen fellow Karolina Hurd, who leads our study of the occupied areas of Ukraine uh, and the gross violations of human rights perpetrated by Russian forces. These four exceptional, dedicated analysts have led our daily publications for the past year. They've been with us from the beginning. They may be young, but they are the world's leading experts on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So please welcome them. Thank you. Thanks, Kim, for the very kind words. And thank you all for being here, both in person and virtually. And thank you to AEI for hosting us in this wonderful space. This is very cool. So to give a quick run through of what we're going to present today, we're going to start with a briefing on the current status of the war and where it, we see it going in 2023. I'll lead off with an introduction on the current state of play, what both sides intend, as well as a sort of top level look at Russian capabilities uh, and what Putin is going for in 2023 and further and the risks of a protracted war in Ukraine. I'll then pass it over to Karolina, who will discuss the ongoing, uh, even if very unsuccessful, Russian offensive in Luhansk Oblast. George will talk about the prospects for the Ukrainian counteroffensives and the importance of Western aid to enable them. And finally, Katerina will talk about the Russian information space and very crucially, our understanding of Putin's decision making and what allows us to have good insight into his decisions throughout this war. At the end, we'll move into a question and answer period. We are happy to take this in any way that is most helpful uh, to y'all. Uh, anything about details of the war, forecasts, units, you will make our days by asking uh, nice and incisive questions. Uh, and finally, helping us throughout all of this, we have AEI's Brady Afric, who will be running the map uh, that has been produced by us throughout the war. And I also just want to shout out Brady as well, who has done some incredible work tracking Russian positions throughout the war, uh, their defensive lines that we have then been able to use in our own work. So that has been very cool. So without further ado, what is the current status of the war one year on from the large-scale Russian invasion on February 24th? Very crucially, the outcome of the war is still in doubt. It's very premature to say that Putin has already lost just because he has not already won his very maximalist objectives of capturing the entirety of Ukraine and controlling it for the long term. We assess that his objectives have remained unchanged uh, and have been for two decades now of dominating Ukrainian politics and ensuring that it is within Russia's sphere of influence for the long term. This latest invasion in the past year has just been the latest attempt to dominate and control Ukraine, dating back to efforts to manipulate Ukraine's politics uh, in the early 21st century, the annexation of Crimea, and the fighting in eastern Ukraine since 2014 and 15, and then now most recently when those attempts to manipulate peace processes failed, the large-scale invasion that we are now seeing in the past year. Uh, in the second panel, Natalia Bugayev will be able to talk more about that as she has been documenting that for ISW from the very beginning, very impressively. What we're now seeing is that the Kremlin is both setting itself up for a protracted war in terms of its force generation and mobilization, as well as the Russian information space, while simultaneously, and I'll explore this a little bit, continuing to push for major operations that the Russian military simply is not prepared to conduct at this moment in time, which is what Lita will be talking about in more detail. Ukraine truly has the opportunity to win this war decisively with sustained and timely Western support. And it's very important to enable Ukraine to defeat this invasion decisively rather than a half measure of only recapturing some territory or some sort of ceasefire uh, in order to ensure that it can harden itself against future Russian attempts to control Ukraine. Because we do not assess that uh, Putin's intent or unfortunately even his successors will really change anytime soon. So where does that leave us with Russian intent and capabilities? As I said, Putin is very much 
doubling down on this being a protracted war. It has been amazing to document across the last year, and particularly even the last two months, we've seen journalists uh, diving into the misunderstandings and flawed view of Ukraine that Putin was in that led to his large-scale invasion uh, last year. It's truly important to remember in the discussions of what we're seeing now with the Russian operations that the Kremlin drank its own Kool-Aid and believed that this was going to be a three-day war. Everyone within the FSB from top to bottom told their boss, yes, sir, the Ukrainians are going to greet us as liberators. No, sir, the Ukrainian military will not fight back. And Gerasimov apparently rolled over, and a chief of the general staff, Valerie Gerasimov, that is, and did not push back on the flawed campaign plan. What we have seen over the course of the past year is the Kremlin very, very gradually learning how badly it misunderstood the scale of Ukrainian resistance it was going to face and it's starting to adapt to fight the large-scale and likely long-term conventional war that it now finds itself in. Now, what has remained continuous throughout uh, this year have been two key items of the Kremlin's decision-making and approach to this. One is trying to do too much at once, and two of still trying to avoid treating this as a full war. Now, for the first one, really goes back to the initial Russian invasion where they attempted to advance on six axes with elements of all of Russia's major military units, all 12 armies, without focusing on a single main objective at once. Ukraine was able to defeat that uh, with the help of uh, Western aid, as well as the sheer tenacity and creativity of Ukrainian forces, not to mention Ukrainian civil society and the importance of how strong Ukrainian will has been throughout this war. The Russians have continued that really over the past year in continuing to advance on too many lines of effort at once. For example, once they lost the Battle of Kyiv in April, they still tried to conduct large-scale encirclements of Ukrainian forces in eastern Ukraine, and we saw over the course of the summer them steadily pull back into smaller and smaller attempted encirclements until they achieved their last great victory of the war, in heavy air quotes, of capturing the city of Severodonetsk last summer. Since then, the Russians have lost further terrain to Ukrainian counteroffensives in Kharkiv and Kherson, and even now, the large offensive that Lena will talk about is trying to do too much when the Russians really needed to wait several more months to reconstitute their forces. And I'll come back a little bit later to that. The second item there is it's very important that the Kremlin and Putin continues to refer to this as the special military operation. It is not being treated as a war. We are seeing, a, a, in a effect, efforts to fully mobilize the Russian population and defense industrial base very belatedly for a large-scale war. But this is being done ex post facto. The original Russian forces that we saw move in one year ago were pulled from the peacetime cadres of the Russian military with some conscripts added in uh, and suffered incredibly high casualties early on. This has really impeded a lot of Russia's efforts to replace these losses over time, regenerate forces, and be able to conduct large-scale operations at this point in 2023, though they are taking some steps to rectify that now. So what are those? Well, as we've seen, Putin is really focusing on turning this war into being an existential struggle for the Russian people. We've seen a remarkable uniformity to his statements over the past year in terms of this being a threat from NATO, the war in Ukraine being uh, important to the survival of the Russian state, and dedicating Russia to fight as long as is necessary. The thing is, this has been matched with a strange disconnect with the actual uh, decisions he has made in terms of the scale he is willing to fight this war on. Katya will be talking about that in more depth later on. In the sense that, we got what was known as partial mobilization last fall, trying to replace a lot of Russian losses in the first six months of the war. That was partially a stopgap measure to uh, stiffen Russian lines for the expected Ukrainian counteroffensives last fall, uh, which possibly could have been even more effective without those direct infusions of Russian personnel, as well as setting up personnel for this current winter and into spring Russian offensive that we are observing now. However, the Russian government still has not fully mobilized in terms of industry. We're seeing belated attempts to centralize control of production, 
um, and try to actually replace the massive losses that Russian forces have suffered. Uh, it has been incredible, the documentation that's been possible in the open source from Oryx and others, our own work of how many uh, casualties and how many armored vehicles the Russians have lost. But this is still being done without trying to rock the boat too much uh, in Russia domestically. Now, I don't want to overstate that and say that Putin is at risk of a coup or a revolution if he pushes his population too far. But he does, he has consistently shown himself to hold back from more maximalist decisions about the scale of the war and mobilization. And certainly, just to be very frank about it, he is not going to use a nuclear weapon either in Ukraine or against NATO. And we can talk about that more later on and why we continue to assess that to be the case. However, the Russian military is finally taking steps to re-centralize control of the war uh, and fight it in a more cohesive manner. We saw announced in December of last year and then more formally enacted in January of this year a series of intended reforms and restructures within the Russian Ministry of Defense, uh, including, very notably, the reappointment of Chief of the Russian General Staff Valery Gerasimov as the theater commander in Ukraine. Now, throughout the first year of the war, the Russians shuffled through a number of different commanders at the military district and service level, uh, trying to orchestrate operations, and even early on, really struggling to coordinate their different axes of advance. We're now seeing the Ministry of Defense essentially re-centralize control within the old guard of its officers. Grasimov uh, is a career officer. He's been in that position since 2012 and is in many ways responsible for the early and poor planning of the invasion. We're also seeing a number of officers that don't have combat experience, staff officers with connections to Grasimov, being elevated and put in charge of operations in this continuing attempt to re-centralize control. Other aspects of this is the attempted sidelining of the Wagner Group after they have in some ways outlived their usefulness to the Kremlin uh, last fall with the fighting around Bakhmut, as well as attempting to more directly integrate the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic's forces into the Russian Ministry of Defense. The other flip side of that is the Kremlin is trying to restructure its military to fight large-scale conventional wars. However, these reforms are going to take a long time to actually have an effect on the battlefield if they will be able to uh, at all. It's one thing for the Kremlin to say it will uh, increase the size of its military from 1.36 million soldiers to 1.5 million soldiers and introduce 12 new divisions, when even the Russian units currently fighting in Ukraine are incredibly on paper formations and have suffered very, very substantial losses. However, this is the key item they can rebuild those losses and they will be able to leverage their uh, defense industrial base, even as damaged as it is by sanctions and the losses they have suffered, if they are given time to do so. In the sense that these efforts may not affect the outcome of the current Russian offensive and likely won't even affect the outcome of the expected Ukrainian uh, spring counteroffensive. But if they are given time to recuperate into 2024, there is a real risk of not only Russian forces being able to further entrench themselves on the territories that they have occupied, but even possibly restart more effective offensive operations. This is why it is so important to not talk about the war in Ukraine as uh, an assumed stalemate. And there's been a lot of discussions of, well, there's no point in giving Ukraine further weapons and uh, sustained supplies because the front lines are going to be frozen and there will be Russian forces coming in later this year and into 2024. The directionality of that, we believe, is flipped. Ukraine needs sustained and rapid support in order to carry out its own counteroffensives and be able to plan for future ones. We'll talk about this a little further on, but Unfortunately, Ukraine is not going to be able to conduct one war-winning counteroffensive. It is going to take successive and sustained counteroffensives throughout the next year and possibly into 2024 to retake uh, the Russian-occupied territory. The Ukrainian military needs to be able to plan around having supplies over time rather than this reactionary uh, approach of not knowing exactly when they will be able to ingest new equipment into their forces. The announcement of supplies of different Western armored vehicles and additional munitions and artillery is incredibly important, but unfortunately there was likely a window of opportunity missed late last year before the Russian forces had the opportunity to replace some of their more devastating losses. George will talk in more detail about the prospects for a Ukrainian counteroffensive and the importance of Western aid, but I just want to note that for now. 
So in closing on my sort of broad stroke statements on the war, it is possible for Ukraine to win a decisive victory against this Russian invasion and necessary both for, of course, Ukrainian security as well as U.S. national interests to ensure that Ukraine can do so. Not only to defeat this Russian invasion, but to harden itself against any future Russian attempts to dominate Ukraine, either militarily or through other approaches, because the Kremlin will likely revert to other me mechanisms of influence in Ukraine and try to assert control. It's important. Ukraine can win. It is going to be a long, hard fight, however, and we cannot, uh, we as the West and the United States certainly cannot rest on our laurels of the very important aid that has already been provided. We, of course, at ISW will continue to be documenting the war as it enters its second year, going to be doing the daily updates as long as it's needed, as well as our control of terrain maps. Um, and we are certainly proud to do so. And what has really kept us going this year has been seeing the impact uh, it has had. And we cannot thank those that use our materials enough uh, for the incredible response that we have received. I'll stop yapping for now, pass it over to the rest of the team that are responsible for writing these incredible updates and maps. Uh, and so to focus in on what we've been observing more directly in the last few months, I'll kick it over to Carolina Hurd to talk about the Russian offensive in Luhansk. Thank you so much for the introduction, Mason. So where does this bring us today, one year into the war? Well, the next major Russian offensive is currently underway. And this time, it's underway in this, on this line in the uh, Luhansk Oblast region of eastern Ukraine. We've observed a new front line form roughly between the borders of Kharkiv Oblast and Luhansk Oblast, specifically concentrated around a line that runs between two settlements in western Luhansk Oblast, Sviatova and Kremina, and then this line dips a little bit into northern Donetsk Oblast around the Liman area where Russian forces suffered a catastrophic loss in September of 2022. We're seeing a very interesting shift in the way that the Russian military has been carrying out this offensive in that we're suddenly seeing the, the deployment of conventional units in doctrinally sound formations to the Luhansk Oblast front line. Over the past few months, we've seen mostly non-standard and non-doctrinal applications of force formation, specifically with the Wagner Group and their offensives around Bakhmut. But now we're seeing a very conventional and doctrinally aligned deployment of mostly Western military district formations along the Luhansk Oblast front line. We've observed that this front line is the area of responsibility of Russia's Western military district which has committed two motor rifle divisions to the area, specifically both motorized rifle regiments and one tank regiment of the 144th Motor Rifle Division, and at least two motorized rifle regiments of the third Motor Rifle Division that we have not yet observed its tank regiment. These units are being deployed in a doctrinally consistent way and have been committed to decisive offensive operations specifically between Sviatova and Kremina. We've also observed that the Western military district forces on this line are being supported at least in some capacity by elements of the central military district with at least one full tank regiment, the 6th tank regiment of the 90th tank division of the central military district in the Sviatova area. We've also seen some ad hoc and irregular support coming from troops of the DNR and the LNR, specifically with the LNR's 4th Regiment in the Bilohorivka area to the southern part of this front line. We've also seen some very limited but potentially increasing presence of the Russian Airborne Forces, the VDV, specifically the 76 Guards um, Air Assault Division. So we're seeing these units that used to be considered very elite, um, elite units of mechanized warfare, and they have been committed to this area since about January of this year. So that's what we're seeing. But what we're not seeing is just as informative to the state of the Russian military at this time. We're really not seeing very many elements of the first guards tank army. The Western Military District commands three armies, the 6th Combined Arms Army, the 20th Combined Arms Army, and the 1st Guards Tank Army. Before the war, the 1st Guards Tank Army was considered the premier mechanized strike force of the Russian military, but it was absolutely clobbered in previous, well, that, that would be the correct word, clobbered. That's, that's a doctrinal term. <laughs> that is. Yeah. 
it was absolutely destroyed in previous uh, Russian losses um, as Ukrainians conducted very, very successful counteroffensives prior in 2022. So the first guards tank army is very much limited in its presence along this new front line. We're not seeing its major motor rifle division, which is the second motor rifle division. This in, in and out of itself is very noteworthy. The second motor rifle division was deployed to Belarus for training and reconstitution until about January of this year, when Ukrainian military intelligence reported that it was removed from Belarus and elements of the second motor rifle division deployed back to Russia and elements of the second motor rifle division deployed to Luhansk Oblast. We have not seen the second motor rifle division or its constituent elements come online in Luhansk Oblast yet, which may well mean that the second motor rifle division is still in reserve in the rear of Luhansk Oblast. Although we continue to assess that when it does come online, if it does, it will not change the course of this offensive operation. We're also not seeing elements of the fourth tank division, which was kind of considered the first guards tank army's premier unit. And this is largely because the fourth tank division became notorious for basically being the largest donor of tanks to the Ukrainian army <laughs> during the Kharkiv Oblast counteroffensive in September of 2022. The 4th Tanks Division, the 4th Tank Division's two constituent tank regiments, the 12th and 13th Tank Regiment, lost significant amounts of uh, kit as they fled from the Ukrainian counteroffensive in Kharkiv Oblast in September 2022. We haven't seen either the 12th or the 13th Tank Regiment come online in the Luhansk Oblast, and we assess that's because there's not much of them left. We know from military estimates that Russian forces have lost about half of their pre-war tank fleet in one year of the war. This also means that they've lost 50% of their main battle tank fleet. And these are the types of tanks that these tank regiments would need to reconstitute and come back online to pursue decisive offensive operations in Luhansk Oblast. A tank regiment, in order to be a tank regiment, requires about 100 tanks. So reconstituting these two tank regiments in a way that would make them actually effective striking forces would require about 200 tanks. And the current state of the Russian defense industrial base would not be able to essentially materialize 200 tanks out of nowhere. So kind of comparing the units that we know are deployed and how they're being deployed, as well as the units that we just know aren't there, we can make an overall assessment on the state of this of the Russian military as it currently stands and its prospects for actually pursuing a successful offensive operation in Luhansk Oblast. There's been a lot of back and forth in Western reporting about whether or not this offensive has begun, and it has begun. It's been going on for a few weeks in earnest, but really the conditions have been set for the entirety of 2023 so far. But looking at the units that aren't there and how poorly trained and uh, what well, poorly disciplined the units that are deployed are, we can say that this offensive is underway even if it's not making gains. This is truly the best that the Russian military can do in this current moment. We also know that there aren't really that many reserves in the rear that could deploy either to Luhansk Oblast or to other places in the front to turn the tide of the war because we have pretty good visibility into what's deployed where throughout the rest of Ukraine. If we zoom down into Donetsk Oblast to the Bakhmut area, this has obviously been a point of focus in the last few months as the Wagner Group has been pursuing incredibly costly offensive operations to make very, very minor tactical gains in the Bakhmut area. Wagner has been fighting for Bakhmut really since May of 2022, but in earnest since August of 2022, and still have failed to encircle the, the city. We also know that the Wagner offensive on Bakhmut is largely culminating. They relied at first very heavily on artillery, using about 60,000 shells a day, well, the Russian military in general, not just Wagner, but the Russian military was using about 60,000 uh, artillery shells a day at the beginning of the war, and now it's, that's down to 20,000 shells. So we know that their ability, just as a general military apparatus, to conduct massed fires before launching into um, infantry assaults has very much decreased, which is kind of uh, Wagner's assaults on Bakhmut has been a microcosm of that. We've seen Wagner rely less and less on artillery fire and more and more on squad-sized frontal assaults on very fortified Ukrainian positions in Bakhmut. They're simply not taking beyond just tactical ground in Bakhmut. 
and their offensive has culminated and is culminating. So we've observed that elements of the VDV, the airborne forces, are now supplanting Wagner operations around Bakhmut. So we know that Wagner is very active around Bakhmut still, but that the VDV is also present there and as I mentioned before on the Luhansk Oblast front line. That's a significant portion of the Russian military. And then if we move along to the Donetsk city area, we know that forces of the First Army Corps, uh, the Donetsk People's Republic, are heavily committed along the, the Donetsk city, the western outskirts of Donetsk city, with some very, very minimal support from the Southern Military District's 150th Motor Rifle Regiment. If you look at the map here, you can see that the areas where the DNR forces are currently fighting are within kilometers of the front line that has existed since 2014. And they simply have not made gains in this area, even though they've been fighting. These lines have existed since 2014, and they've been fighting in earnest for the, this area for over a year now. This is because DNR troops have significant issues with discipline and morale and command, these sorts of issues that are very pervasive and impact their capacity. And if we move down to the Vuladar area, which is in western Donetsk Oblast and has made a lot of news lately, we know that there are elements mostly of the Eastern Military District, as well as the 155th Naval Infantry Brigade, heavily committed in this area. In October of 2022, the Naval Infantry Forces around Vuladar suffered massive, massive defeats. And then again, in the last few weeks, conducted very costly assaults on Vuladar that cost them men and equipment and very much uh, forced that, that attack into culmination. So we zoom out and we think about all of the different units that are deployed throughout this current front line in Donbass. This really indicates to us, and we know that based on different uh, Western military estimates, that 97% or more of the, of the Russian military is currently deployed in Ukraine. There's not this reserve that's waiting in the rear, ready to deploy in Luhansk Oblast to turn the tide of the war. They really don't exist. So where does that leave us going into 2023? So the units that have currently been deployed to the Luhansk Oblast front line where this offensive is ongoing will culminate. They've already been fighting in this area for almost two months. And we know that they are mostly reconstituted units that, are, that have been reconstituted with mobilized personnel. They have issues with uh, discipline, training, that sort of thing. And they will culminate. So that will allow Ukrainian troops in this area and other sectors of the front to regain the initiative. Thanks, Lena. So to expand on that a little bit before talking about the prospects of Ukrainian counteroffensives, I want to zoom back a little bit to the problem of why the Russians are overcommitting to this unsuccessful offensive so early. Um, again, there, as Lena noted, there was a lot of discussion, and frankly, when we first published our updates saying that the Russian offensive had begun, we got a lot of pushback from some other analysts saying there's no way, there's no changes on the ground. Well, just because there aren't any changes on the ground doesn't mean the Russians aren't trying, and this is simply uh, all that they're able to achieve at this point in time, of course, due to the very, very stiff Ukrainian resistance. The thing is, is this is what I referred to earlier, and that Putin is pressuring the Russian military into further offensive operations before it's ready. After the Ukrainian counteroffensives last fall, in August and September and into October with the loss of Kherson, the Russian military was likely at its weakest. The Kremlin ordered this partial mobilization to rush personnel to the front lines. We saw repeated instances of troops ending up in Donetsk Oblast 72 hours after leaving Moscow with no intermediate training. Um, it was a sign of the desperation of the Russian forces to plug those gaps. While the actual Russian conscript class that was brought up in November of last year was being held back for training and going into actual formal units, the ones that we are now seeing in Luhansk Oblast. They were trained both at Russian training grounds and, very crucially, uh, at Belarusian training grounds. And I remember looking back at our forecasts when we saw that conscript class being uh, brought into training, that we assessed that they would be ready for major combat operations in May or June of this year. We are now seeing them being sent into our operations in February and even, in some cases, January of this year. So while they had some time to train up these personnel, reconstitute forces, these uh, Russian units are not ready. These are the shattered remnants of uh, Western military district units that took heavy losses earlier in the war. And it's very likely that this Russian uh, offensive will run out of steam uh, in the coming weeks and into months. 
That will, of course, give Ukrainian forces uh, an opportunity to conduct their own counteroffensives if they are properly supported with Western aid, uh, which George Boros will now talk about. Thank you, Mason. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. It's our hope and our assessment that uh, 2023 will be the year of Ukrainian counteroffensives. There's a really important point that I want to hammer home. Uh, the Russians have failed so far in their objectives for the war invasion of Ukraine, not just because the Russian military is bad, but also because the Ukrainians are actually quite skillful and quite good. The Ukrainians have demonstrated time and time again throughout their successful defensive operations and then their limited but well-scoped counteroffensive operations that the Ukrainians are actually quite adept operational planners. Every single time that the Ukrainians have attempted a counteroffensive, it's, it's gone as planned and it's been successful. And the Ukrainians have been able to use the limited resources that they have in order to defeat what should be a conventionally a much more superior force. For 2023, the Ukrainians seek to conduct counteroffensives to liberate their territory, uh, including Donbass and including Crimea. I want to be very clear that the Ukrainians do not have the combat power to be able to conduct one single major counteroffensive in order to liberate all of Ukraine with a single operation. It's going to require a series of well-scoped, well-planned, metered, phased counteroffensives that will occur in space and time and set preferable con uh, conditions for the subsequent operations. The Ukrainians already demonstrated that they were able to do this with the way that the Kherson counteroffensive and the Kharkiv counteroffensive back in summer and fall of 2022 were able to actually play off of each other in order to uh, generate that effect. Now, that's going to be challenging for the Ukrainians to do so. The Ukrainians can't do this by themselves. They have the manpower, but they still need the materiel. And I want to be very clear, if it was not for decisive Western aid that the United States and Ukraine's Western security partners sent Ukraine in the first, uh, well, in the leading up to the war, and then also during the war so far, that Ukraine would have already lost this war. But Ukrainian victory is not guaranteed, and neither is Russian defeat. It's extremely important that the United States and Ukraine's Western uh, security partners continue to send Ukraine the aid that Ukraine needs to not only just initiate counteroffensive operations, but also sustain them over time to achieve their objectives. Um, I want to chat now a little bit about some of uh, the prospects for exactly what the Ukrainians will, will seek to achieve vis-a-vis -vis their counteroffensives. Um, I'll talk about the rest of the front line that Lena uh, has not talked about yet, which will be in southern Ukraine in the Zaporizhia and Kherson area. What we see here is uh, a relatively, uh, this is an area of the front line that the Russian military is not prioritizing. We largely see here some of the dregs of the Russian conventional army. We see elements of the Eastern military district uh, that come from far Eastern Russia, from Mongolia, near Japan and China, the Pacific Ocean. They are largely occupying uh, this, this area in Zaporizhia Oblast, and they're not really conducting offensive operations. Again, these are low readiness, uh, low quality troops, and they're largely just digging in. Uh, thanks to Brady Afric's work, we've seen a whole lot of field fortifications and extensive uh, lines, consecutive layered lines of defense spanning uh, through Zaporizhia Oblast and into Kherson Oblast, which indicate that the Russians really don't intend to conduct major maneuver warfare and offensive operations in this area to either push across the Dnipro River into Kherson or uh, to push further north towards Zaporizhia at this time. Rather, they are setting conditions to be able to make it very difficult for the Ukrainians uh, to contest that territory and reinvade. Like Lena mentioned, all the decisive and really the best units that the Russian military has left, they are focusing and prioritizing uh, the eastern sector of this 1,000-kilometer-long uh, front line. So um, I just want to say also that, you know, the Ukrainians are going to have to be careful about how they are going to set up conditions successfully to conduct their counteroffensive. We're currently in the middle of the Russian offensive in Luhansk, and the Ukrainians can't simply initiate 
their own counteroffensive at their exact desired uh, place and time and choosing, there's going to be factors on the ground that are going to facilitate that. Um, the Russian culmination, when it occurs, likely this spring uh, or early summer, is going to set favorable conditions for the Ukrainians to be able to counterattack. Like Lena mentioned, the Russians simply do not have reserve forces that they can rush to a particular area of the front line to be able to protect against the Ukrainian counteroffensive. The Russians are already committing many of their elite forces from the airborne forces. And we assess that after the Russian campaign in Luhansk and Donetsk culminates, that will be a very good time for the Ukrainians to begin their own counteroffensive. I don't want to speculate on the particular location or where the Ukrainians will uh, launch their counteroffensive. As a matter of ISW policy, we do not forecast or um, try to assess Ukrainian operations. But if you look at the Russian activity, uh, what they've been doing in the fields in order to fortify, if you look at Russian sources and where they fear counteroffensives, and then if you also look at the strategically important territory in Ukraine, you'll see this corridor in Zaporizhia Oblast between Tokmak, Melitopol, and Vasilivka of uh, the juncture of a series of important uh, highways, arterial roads, and railroads, which are very important for sustaining um, the several uh, tens of thousands of Russian soldiers that currently occupy this southern portion of Ukraine. The Kremlin used to be able to count on a main supply route through the Kerch Strait Bridge coming from Crimea. Um, however, that bridge is degraded from Ukrainian attacks um, and its reliability is unknown. So this is a sector that's vulnerable potentially uh, and I'm not going to forecast anything, but I, I keep my eyes peeled on this particular area. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Ukrainian capabilities um, and their ability to actually conduct this counteroffensive. Um, unfortunately, uh, there have been missed opportunities to conduct a counteroffensive in the last six months. Uh, we were forecasting that the Ukrainians were going to likely conduct a counteroffensive over the winter because the Ukrainians had a tremendous amount of momentum. They liberated Kherson in September. Uh, the Russians then, or rather, they, they liberated uh, Kharkiv in September. The Russians then withdrew uh, from Kherson in November. And that was right around the, close to the same time when the Russians conducted their mass mobilization to try to rush bodies to the lines in order to stiffen them. And the way that the Ukrainians were conducting these phased, simultaneous, um, and sequential uh, operations showed that they had a series of planned operations to keep hitting the Russian military and denying them the initiative and denying them reprieve to, to rest, which was a smart, actually a very smart way that the Ukrainians were planning their operations. So therefore, it made sense that the Ukrainians would try to keep that string running, uh, keep that momentum going, and conduct uh, a counteroffensive over the winter. But that didn't materialize in large part because the Ukrainians did not receive the key crucial material that they need in order to sustain uh, their counteroffensive operations. The Ukrainians, the Ukrainians depend on our aid, and it's been frustrating to see some of the dynamics in the way which the West has been uh, suboptimally implementing our security assistance with regards to timing and phasing. We've been studying the war in Ukraine for a long time, and we've realized that uh, the policy debate often lags behind the actual battlefield realities of what the Ukrainians need. The Ukrainians demonstrated and, and uh, articulated an explicit need for HIMAR systems, advanced air defense systems like NASAMs, and then main battle tanks back in June. The Ukrainians actually did get the HIMARS in July, but NASAMs only arrived around November, and we're only pledging main battle tanks now. And the, the United States plans to deliver our Abrams tanks uh, in quarter four of this year, or quarter one of 2024, <laughs> many, many months after the need for these systems arised. Now, this is significant because this is actually not just the latest iteration of this problem, but it's actually systematic and it's a pattern, especially if you look at the way of how the United States has really kept Ukraine on the starvation diet for the aid that it needs. Back in 2014, when the Russians initially invaded Ukraine, um, the most extreme range uh, and the most extreme uh, far reaches of the policy debate was there's no way we can send the Ukrainians uh, sniper rifles and javelins. That's just too much. 
but then we hemmed and hawed, and then in 2016 or 2017, we sent them javelins, but they have to be maintained in storage depots in Western Ukraine. They can't go close to the front lines. And then in 2019, we had a, a wave of clarity, and we said, okay, we can send the, the javelins to the front lines. And then it became obvious that the Russians were planning this offensive, and we sent them more javelins, and we sent them stingers and other stuff, but we said, we're not going to send you guys vehicles, and we're not going to send you field artillery, and we're not going to send you long-range uh, uh, HIMARS rocket artillery. And we've sort of perpetually kept doing this. Okay, now we'll send you this, but we're not going to send you strikers. Okay, we're not going to send you strikers, but we're not, we'll send you that, but not the main battle tanks. Okay, we're not going to send you main battle tanks, or we will send you main battle tanks, but we're not going to send you fixed-wing aircraft. So um, really, if our policy objective in Ukraine has not changed, and that's always been, we want Ukraine to have full control and re regain control over its uh, de jure internationally recognized and sovereign territory, then we should empower the Ukrainians, give them all the tools that they need, because the Ukrainians have demonstrated that they're very responsible recipients of security assistance. They are able to use all the systems that we give them. They don't have capability choke, uh, capability limitations that they choke on these more advanced systems. They, they use them quite well. Um, so it, it's our hope that finally after the Ukrainians receive some of these main battle tanks that are slowly starting to trickle in. And as the Russians culminate uh, in the spring, that the Ukrainians will be able to kickstart this counteroffensive um, coming up uh, in, in the summer. The final thing that I'll close on is talking a little bit about some of the capabilities uh, that the Ukrainians have and some of their capability gaps. They really, truly do depend on the aid. It is existential for them. Ukraine is a relatively small country compared to its neighbor, Russia. Their defense industrial base has been uh, devastated from the war. They really do depend on Western supplementation for the weapon systems, the ammunition, um, and even uh, some of the training to convert Ukrainian civilians into uh, battle-ready soldiers. But that said, the Ukrainians also have a lot of good factors that are enabling them to be effective fighters, given and provided the correct resources. Their morale is high. Um, they have a great degree of uh, in, in, in intuition and a great degree of knowing how to uh, take the initiative and operate within uh, intent of their commanders. Um, unlike the Russians who, whenever their commander dies or Vladimir Putin doesn't give clear directions, they seize up. So it's our assessment that uh, this will be probably a better year for Ukraine than the previous, but truly the decisive factor will be the way that the West sends Ukraine aid. And we'll definitely be watching that closely of where Russian forces are deployed, the weaknesses there, but I cannot overstate that importance of over the long term, the correlation of forces will start to drift in Russia's favor and a long war is certainly only in the Kremlin's interests, not in Ukraine's and not in the United States as well. The thing is, is Putin is aware of that and is planning for this while still having these maximalist goals for Ukraine. So finally, before we move on to Q&A, uh, certainly, last but not least, I'd like Katya to talk through our understanding of Putin's decision-making, how he's approaching this war, and also very crucially, what how we do our analysis and assessments of what Putin's intent is and his major speeches, such as the uh, big load of nothing uh, that he gave us on February 22nd, despite some reporting we've seen. So, Katya, over to you. Thank you, Mason. Um, it is a pleasure to talk to you all today. Uh, we assess Putin's actions uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, I probably read way too many Putin speeches in my lifetime. I uh, do not recommend this hobby for anyone, however. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of value that comes from understanding what, where Putin is and uh, what his thought process is from just analyzing his public appearances, also from looking and reading in between the lines of his repeated speeches. Um, I want to touch base on uh, what um, George has been talking um, in terms of Western aid and Russia's uh, interest into um, in. Dis discouraging Ukraine from believing that West is going to continue to support uh, Ukraine on a military level, but also to uh, pose a protracted war both for the domestic audiences and for Western audiences to not, um, not essentially believe in Ukrainian ability to win. Putin currently is preparing um, a narrative for the protracted war. He is re-emerging as a uh, war-involved leader. Uh, we have not seen much of him for 
at least the 10 months um, he didn't really make any significant appearances relating to the war effort. Um, and then he suddenly reemerged in December, uh, making really loud uh, orders, uh, screaming at his ministers to increase industry productions. Um, and it appears to me that he's really trying to go back to that narrative of we had no other option but to invade because Ukraine was threatening our security. And that is a significant narrative that Russia has always employed in um, their respect to Ukraine. Uh, they've used that since 2014 and have always framed Ukraine as uh, an aggressor state, as a threat. Um, but that narrative wasn't very consistent throughout this, uh, this war effort. The return of this uh, tells us that Putin really likely thinks that he is going to win this war, this really long protracted war, by tiring out Western support. And that is something that we really need to watch out for. And there is, uh, we've identified at least four key narratives uh, regarding this issue. Number one, we've seen the narrative of stalemate, which Mason had mentioned in his brief. Uh, the stalemate basically emerged um, around the summer where we were told that Ukraine is not making any progress. Why should anyone care about it? Uh, the other narrative that we see often uh, reemerge, especially when Russia loses on the battlefield, is nuclear threats. Uh, that is something that um, Putin is a master at, uh, vaguely uh, mentioning in his speeches. Um, that is also, he uses his pundits like uh, Dmitry Medvedev to come out and say uh, all of these outlandish statements. Um, that is something that we also need to watch out for, uh, but should not, uh, should not discount the fact that he has been making those statements for 23 years. Um, and also his pundits always go on television and threaten to meet the United States. Uh, that is something that the Kremlin is best at, um, to scare, to um, intensify the narrative. And I think the most important time frame for this nuclear narrative was around November when um, Russian forces have lost Kherson city. And there was a significant discussion over this. And then it just like that died down. Um, the other narrative that we also saw over um, December in particular was um, negotiations. Um, there was a framing that uh, emerged in Western publications that Russia seems to be signaling that they're interested in peace talks. However, they're not really making any serious conditions for such um, negotiations. Um, Russia really needed this narrative to um, stall the time for their offensive operation, which is what we're now seeing unfold in Luhansk Oblast. That's something that we also need to continue to look out for as this war progress, progresses, because Russia um, and Putin itself, uh, himself had not indicated that he's ready to give up his maximalist goals. Um, and he is, in fact, preparing for a protracted war. Um, briefly touching on domestic space, how is he preparing his domestic audience for uh, what it is essentially a large sacrifice, both of um, people, for their morale, for Russian economy. I think he actually expects them to suffer through it, the old Soviet Stalinist way to suffer through it until they will finally see his, uh, this, his vision. Russian people have um, this habit of uh, self-censorship and preservation. And I think the anecdote for this is um, uh, we only saw a, a few, resignation, few resignations from um, the Kremlin and uh, the rest who stayed, the majority who have stayed, um, are reportedly providing very ill-informed, poor um, advice to Putin, uh, proving his loyalty rather than his, their competency. And I think that allegory really translates well into Russian society. Uh, they're afraid for, in terms of self-preservation. Whether they are opposing this war or whether they're you know, indifferent, that is something that we obviously can't assess from open source. But what we can see is that we didn't see many protests um, and it's likely that they're scared to come out. I want to also touch base on uh, partial mobilization and Putin's decision making. Uh, throughout this war, we've seen that Putin is a risk adverse actor. He is afraid to make uh, risks that he thinks might damage his reputation, his regime, and also his reputation abroad. Uh, the primary example of that is partial mobilization. When Russian forces uh, attacked Severodonetsk and Lysychansk and um, essentially seized it at a very bloody cost, 
um, they faced a significant culmination and shortage of forces. Um, they really needed to mobilize at that time. And I'm of, I'm of a strong belief that Russian MOD likely advised Putin to do such mobilization. Uh, but instead, he was concerned over what this would mean for his population, uh, his population that was already um, in this time space of a limited war. They weren't as involved in the preparations. They didn't know what the clear objective of this war was. Um, and so he went with the less risky option of conducting crypto mobilization campaigns over the summer, employing ultra-nationalist groups, as well as um, ordering a volunteer mobilization, a volunteer recruitment, uh, which essentially tried to financially incentivize um, really poor districts in, uh, throughout Russia to join the war effort. He likely realized that that didn't really work out for him and was forced into making uh, the really uh, devastating for him decision of uh, announcing mobilization. But even in that point, he still went for the lower level risk. He said it was partial. He downplayed its significance. He downplayed uh, the amount of people that were about to be mobilized. The understanding of this whole mobilization um, aspect of this also tells us that um, he's incapable of taking the responsibility for almost anything that he does. Um, and when the first flaws emerged with mobilization, he swiftly uh, passed the blame for onto uh, the Russian military, uh, Ministry of Defense, as well as um, all of his command. Um, and uh, that is important because he is showing to his, he's signaling to his audiences that uh, this is uh, this is all their fault. It's not my fault. And you know, I, I'm just here and I'm overseeing and I'm ill-advised and um, I still have a grand vision of big Russia. Um, imperialist Russia, strong Russia. Um, what does his decision making tell us? It tells us that not only is he not ready to take a significant risk and decisive measures to turn around his war, but he is also likely um, incapable of pursuing higher risk activities such as um, actually threatening the use of nuclear weapons against Ukraine or uh, even pursuing an attack against NATO despite what pundits and propagandists tell us uh, almost on every daily basis. Um, our methodology for studying Putin um, in the past year, as well as in years prior, re really relies on kind of a, of a movie of all of his uh, speeches and appearances. Once you look at them as a collective, you realize quickly that he uses the same keywords, the same phrases, um, same threats, same mannerisms, um, it doesn't change. And the situation around the Federal Assembly speech, which is um, our um, address to presidential address, essentially, uh, of the year, really shows us that um, he had nothing to offer. He had no victories to uh, spearhead. Um, he already spearheaded one uh, victory, which was the annexa part annexation of territories that he was in controlling, in full control. Um, and this time, he had nothing to offer. And uh, while the, I, I believe Western media has been really great at covering a lot of uh, um, developments of this war, I do want to preface that it is important not to give uh, these speeches um, just the sole attention. It's very important to look at them as a collective of uh, consistent Kremlin rhetoric to understand that there is not a significant inflection in what he's saying. And he's trying to deflect our attention from what is going on actually on the uh, on the front lines. Um, this brings me also to a point about uh, his announcement that he wants to sus suspend um, participation in START. And I also read it as a manipulation of his um, audience. You know, we read a lot of uh, nationalist uh, military bloggers and correspondents in, in Russia who are these pro-war audiences who really want this war to continue. And um, that also provides a great framework because we see what they pick up and what they want to emphasize. And whenever there is some sort of a nuclear threat or missile threat, they're more likely to pick that up and run with it than um, them running with military failures around um, Ukraine. And this is a domestic conditioning space. So the final remarks I want to leave you with all is that we're going to see a lot more information operations as this war goes on. The main goal for these operations is to 
um, deter Western support for Ukraine, as well as deter Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainians' willingness to continue to fight, to scare them. Uh, we obviously see a lot of uh, um, here and there um, threats that Belarus is going to invade. All of that emerges in Telegram channels, contacted. All of these are efforts to discourage the, the fight. But obviously, one year of this, we're learning and we're going to continue to learn how to monitor the Kremlin and the Kremlin's information operations as a whole. Thanks, Katya. And thank you all for that. Uh, we'll go ahead and move to Q&A now. We'll show the information on the screen of how y'all can submit questions. Um, and while we wait for that to come in, I'd like to just add a couple brief follow-ons of what Katya said of looking at Putin's speeches of it's incredibly important not to have uh, you know, short-term memory loss, so to speak, of how the Kremlin has presented its points, which we see more than we would like to uh, in the sense of oftentimes Putin's speeches will be discussed in Western media as if it is a new statement that he has not made before, uh, when in fact it's even oftentimes the original intent that he announced for the invasion uh, one year ago. And we follow this very closely, and it's really one of ISW's hallmarks, is we've all been staring at this, uh, our fun hobby of watching Putin speeches for years and years and years, and can pick apart uh, when there are new phrases. When, uh, for example, Shoigu, the Russian defense minister, brings in a slightly different threat of a dirty bomb than he usually does when he's trying to change it up, I guess. And it's very important to keep an eye on this, because as Katya said, if you don't look at it with that broader context, it looks like Putin is constantly threatening war with NATO and nuking Ukraine and using nuclear weapons against NATO. However, this is very much in part directed at a domestic audience, and it's important to pair that with what Russian capabilities actually are. 97% of the Russian military, according to UK Defense Secretary Ben Wallace, is engaged in the war in Ukraine. There is no Russian military that can threaten Poland and the Baltics right now. There is no second war coming that NATO needs to be holding back for. This is it. Ukraine is fighting it. Ukraine is fighting the Russian military. However, Putin wants to keep this ambiguity in the information space and this concern that there will be some escalation and even this nuclear escalation as well. And it's uh, really important to not buy into these threats and overemphasize the importance of uh, avoiding a nuclear escalation. There is always the risk of that as long as nuclear weapons exist and as long as two nuclear armed powers are confronting each other. But we do not assess that the Kremlin is going to use nuclear weapons in Ukraine and certainly not against a NATO state uh, at this point in time. And the last thing we want is to self-deter on the risk that he is, in fact, uh, a suicidal madman, which we have not observed him to be, as flawed as his decision-making is, uh, throughout the war in Ukraine, and use that to stop uh, enabling Ukraine to win the decisive victory it needs to. That's my last spiel there. I'll, we've already got some great questions coming in. Uh, and if you're here in the auditorium as well, and you don't have a phone uh, or a device you can use to submit questions, just raise your hand, and we have folks coming around as well uh, in order to take questions. So one of the first questions we've got is about uh, the prospect of Ukraine's manpower. Uh, asking that I understand that Russia has failed in multiple objectives and suffered numerous casualties, but it's curious that the panel is worried about Ukraine's manpower. Um, we've seen some estimations from American officials that Ukraine's casualties are around uh, 120,000. And how long can Ukraine realistically fight and how many counteroffensives can it actually conduct before its manpower is simply drained? So as George stated earlier, as a matter of policy, we don't uh, assess Ukrainian numbers and Ukrainian uh, unit locations uh, to not report those. Certainly happy to report out where the Russian units are, however. Um, but it is important to think through the, the necessity of the Ukrainian military sort of uh, picking and choosing its counteroffensives and being able to do so smartly, with it, which they've done to date. Uh, George, could you talk a little bit about specifically, you touched on it a little bit, but how the Kherson and Kharkiv counteroffensives supported each other? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> the Ukrainians have demonstrated that they're able to identify weaknesses on the Russians' lines, and they're able to conduct shaping operations to prepare particular places, uh, particular parts of vulnerable territory, in order to then uh, conduct an exploitation or maneuver of warfare to physically liberate that territory. Um, Throughout the summer of 2022, the Ukrainians were always alluding to and, and telegraphing, we're going to conduct a counteroffensive. We're going to conduct the counteroffensive. 
Um, like my colleague said, the Russians culminated in Luhansk uh, on the 4th of July. Um, and then the Ukrainians received the HIMARS uh, in late June and start, began shaping the battlefield for their counteroffensive in, in July. And they started uh, using the HIMARS systems to strike. Can we zoom in on the uh, Dnipro River and, and, and uh, Kharkiv or, and Kherson? Um, they began to strike uh, the rear Russian logistic nodes that are here on the uh, left bank of the river, and they began striking the bridges. There's a grand total of three bridges that cross this very wide river in southern Ukraine, um, one of which is a railroad bridge, two of which are road traffic bridges. And essentially, these were the lifelines to sustain uh, close to, I think, 30,000 Russian troops that were on the northern end of this river at the time. And also, of course, they have the regional capital, Kherson City, the only regional capital that the Russians managed to capture throughout the entire course of the war is located on the northern bank of this river. Um, the Ukrainians conducted a, a skillful interdiction campaign. They effectively degraded those bridges to the point that they could no longer be used to either take supplies in or egress Russian forces out. And uh, they did that over the course of many months. The Ukrainians then announced officially the beginning of their actual maneuver phase of the operation on August 29, about two months later. Um, and the Russians, they panicked. Uh, they fought. And there was some maneuver, but, but not a whole lot. But what happened was that Putin was, a, was scared. Uh, the Russian commanders were scared. And they actually, can we zoom out now to Kharkiv? What the Russians did is they redeployed a lot of Russian conventional units and other forces that were located in this now blue area here in the north, brought them around to the south to reinforce that territory in order to defeat this Ukrainian uh, ongoing counteroffensive. And what happened is that Fundamentally, due to the geography of the territory, this was a, on the north side of the river, it was a militarily untenable position. And so what happened was that the Ukrainians actually then conducted a second counteroffensive while this one was still ongoing. In September, the Ukrainians began a rapid counteroffensive in Kharkiv Oblast, which uh, really in like the span of two weeks managed to liberate uh, many tens of thousands, uh, tens of thousands of kilo square kilometers and they routed the Russian forces that were located here, including significant elements of the Russian Fourth Guards Tank Division. Um, this occurred in, in September. And then in November, the Ukrainians were actually able to compel the Russians to abandon and pull out from Kherson. Um, this indicates that you know, the Ukrainians were actually able to be able to conduct combined arms warfare, be able to trick the Russians uh, with misdirection and use limited forces. For the Kherson operation, or rather for the Kharkiv operation, the Ukrainians used four brigades. Um, that's about 20,000 soldiers. 20,000 soldiers is also just the amount of soldiers that the United Kingdom has pledged to train in the UK uh, over the course of this current year. So um, it's quite significant. And what I'll say is there's a difference in the way that Russian units fight and the way that Ukrainian units fight. 20,000 well-trained Ukrainian soldiers operating in doctrinally sound formations within brigades are a lot more effective than 20,000 Russian prisoners that are fed to conduct a squad-sized assaults against a Ukrainian reinforced stronghold. So it's a little bit apples and oranges, but the Ukrainians, their morale is high, their recruitment is good, Western partners are helping crank out trained, well-trained, motivated Ukrainian soldiers, and uh, we don't see that being a constraining factor for this war. Right. And what's been so impressive about the Ukrainian operational design is they've been able to maximize their limited forces of forcing the Russians to abandon that northern uh, right bank area of Kherson Oblast through this interdiction campaign and then uh, demoralize so heavily the Russian forces in Kharkiv simultaneously. Um, excellent question. Thank you for asking. Someone said, what is the area with blue strikes directly south of Zaporizhia? Those areas on the map are where we have assessed Ukrainian partisan operations, which have been very effective. Uh, George did a wonderful product on this actually earlier this year. We've seen sustained resistance to Russian occupation and interdiction of not just their logistics nodes, but their uh, occupation structures as well that have certainly helped enable uh, a lot of Ukrainian counteroffensives as well. And I'm sure that will continue uh, into 2023. Uh, this next question is for Lena. How would you evaluate the operational performance of the Wagner Group in Bakhmut versus the regular Russian military? That's a really interesting question because it, it is a bit of an apples and oranges comparison. 
Um, the Wagner Group, as we've all become very, very well aware, is largely a, a prisoner recruit base. These are men that have been taken from prisons all over Russia and basically offered freedom in exchange for fighting um, in Ukraine. And they are fighting in a very, very non-standard format using typically squad-sized assault groups on very, very highly fortified Ukrainian positions. Also, Bakhmut is a city. Um, it is, this is urban, urban combat for the Wagner group. Um, and we know that they are very much fighting an, an attritional offensive because they are burning manpower and equipment on basically trying to take Ukrainian fortifications. And this is compounded by the fact that they lack discipline. A lot of them lack um, formal military training. And there's also very high rates of desertion and just very poor behavior within the Wagner group. The conventional forces that are fighting in Luhansk Oblast are at least, at, in, to some capacity, trained in more doctrinally consistent ways. They are somehow, uh, to some degree, supported and uh, reconstituted with mobilized recruits who also have had less uh, formal training, but they are not necessarily the same type of uh, recruits that we're seeing with Wagner, which are very, very heavily pr like prison-based. Um, we see very different tactics, or we've, uh, from what we've observed in Luhansk Oblast, this is manifesting slightly different tactics. Uh, we're seeing Russian forces fight very, very hard for small amounts of area, but this is mostly cr uh, countryside, so they're fighting more into like Ukrainian trenches um, as opposed to fighting into uh, urban areas. So both the force composition and the, the terrain in these areas is very much uh, manifesting in differentiated tactics between the Wagner Group and Bakhmut, and then the mostly Western military district conventional elements in Luhansk Oblast. Yeah, though certainly still disparities uh, in success there. I have a question for Katya, uh, if you could take this. What, is, and I appreciate the phrasing of this, what is the vaunted Russian Air Force up to, especially the bomber squadrons? <laughs> I'm sorry, what is the last part? The Russian Air Force up doing now, especially their bomber squadrons. Oh, um, the Russian Air Force has been um, conducting this uh, missile strike campaign against uh, uh, Ukrainian infrastructure, um, especially Ukrainian ener energy infrastructure. And it also has a root in the ultra-nationalist desires of what uh, Russians envision this war, especially the pro-Russian um, war factions that... Um, are essentially rooting for this war to continue. Uh, when Russia began to experience uh, significant military losses, there was, this, uh, there was a, an emerging question amongst the ultra-nationalist factions that provide a lot of recruits for Russian forces. Um, where is our missile and air force and what are they up to and why are they not striking Ukrainian territory? Uh, we see that they're not very, very effective at striking military targets but at least they can do something and they destroy, they can destroy uh, Ukrainian civilian infrastructure. And after that, we saw um, the commander um, of the joint group of uh, joint forces uh, in Ukraine at that time, uh, Sergei Surovikin, uh, order a lot of these missile strikes that have significantly drained um, Russian um, mi missile capacities. Um, to the point where now uh, Ukrainian officials are estimating that they can only conduct like 20 strikes a week, maybe in two weeks, uh, where before they could launch up to 100 missiles at a time. Um, so largely, we're not seeing a lot of commitment from uh, Russian air forces. Uh, we're also not seeing a lot of um, commitment from uh, missile forces and not being successful in dictating changes to a front line. Uh, but also naval forces have been kind of out of this picture as well. Um, so it looks like Russia is really pushing this uh, infantry, uh, the, this infantry fight, um, as well as the, um, uh, all of their uh, previous attempts uh, with um, failing to make any cohesive uh, changes with the mechanized forces that they have. So we've got a related question for George. Uh, what do the new patriot systems that have arrived in Ukraine do for Ukraine? How does it enable them to both defend their rear areas as well as what does it change about their operations on the front lines? Yeah. Uh, Ukraine uses the patriot systems in order to deny the airspace uh, within Ukraine, which is very important. 
What's been interesting about this war is that there was never any single point in time, and hopefully never will be a time, in which the Russians have air supremacy or air superiority within Ukraine. And that's been very important because it, it denies the Russian ability to conduct combined arms. It helps protect critical infrastructure uh, that's both for civilians, dual use, and military. Um, and it allows for the Ukrainians to be able to better protect and sustain their forces, as well as the critical ground lines of communication through which uh, Western aid comes in. Um, protects it both from Russian fighter aircraft, as well as from uh, Russian air threats like the cruise missiles that Kachi just talked about. Um, we, we don't study exactly the way that the Ukrainians use these systems in order to protect critical infrastructure, but Ukrainian officials have alluded to the fact that they have special ways that they essentially layer on and have uh, essentially redundancies in the way that they use NASAMs, Patriots, their existing Buk and S-300 systems in order to protect uh, important territory and important facilities. Um, the air war is actually really interesting, and you know I'll just go on the side if I may. Uh, the Ukrainians, despite having a, a much smaller military and despite their capabilities on paper being a lot uh, more, more mod uh, modest than what the Russians have, the Ukrainians are actually much better at conducting combined arms warfare that, in that have integrated fires, that find ways to use attack aircraft in conjunction with fires and maneuver elements. The, the Kharkiv counteroffensive in the north in the blue, um, the American AGM-88 harm missiles that go and strike Russian radar and air defense systems was very important because during that counteroffensive that lasted about two weeks, the Ukrainians were able to fly tactical aircraft to provide local air support for the ground maneuver, which is a much more sophisticated use of military art than and operational art than really what the Russians have been able to demonstrate since really the first couple days of the initial invasion. So we've got a question for Lena. What do we know of what is going on within Russian-occupied areas of Ukraine? Yeah, so we've observed a number of different campaigns in occupied areas behind Russian lines that have to do with exerting control over civilian populations uh, in a number of ways, political, social, economic. Um, we've seen a slate of different infrastructure projects, social projects, economic projects, that are essentially meant to integrate occupied areas of Ukraine into the Russian system. In terms of the kind of economic uh, side, we're seeing that the occupied regions are trying to secure patronage projects with different regions of Russia in order to provide um, economic support, support with infrastructure projects, that sort of thing. Um, on the bureaucratic and legal side, we've seen very concerted efforts from both the uh, occupation heads and then on the, the Kremlin level to integrate occupied areas of Ukraine into the Russian legal system. On the social level, and this is something that I've been observing really closely, we've seen a slate of measures carried out to basically russify occupied areas and eliminate Ukrainian identity in a variety of ways. We've seen the installation of Russian curricula in schools in occupied areas, the forced military patriotic education of youth in occupied areas, um, social benefit programs that are meant to basically force people to interact with occupation organs, such as maternity capital or the registration of birth certificates. We've also seen, and probably the most nefarious way that uh, occupational control is being instituted over occupied areas, the mass deportation of Ukrainian populations, specifically children, uh, further into Russian occupied areas of Ukraine, um, as well as to Russia itself. We've observed a concerted effort to remove Ukrainian children from their homes and families in occupied areas and remove them to Russia using a variety of different schemes and forcibly adopt some of these children into Russian families. All of these lines of effort that we've observed to basically exert maximum control over occupied areas in the uh, political, military, economic, and social sphere is something that we as an organization maintain is, could amount to an ethnic cleansing campaign and certainly a potential violation of the Convention on the Punishment and Prevention of the Crime of Genocide. And Lena's being modest here. We've had a quite the busy week. Lena and George were just on Wednesday uh, in New York speaking at the United Nations General Assembly on just this topic uh, on a panel of Russian uh, violations of human rights ongoing in Ukraine. 
We have two questions related uh, to Prigozhin, who is the financier of the Wagner Group. Uh, one is, what is our view of the status of the Prigozhin-Putin situation? Is Prigozhin toast? Uh, and second, uh, what are the interactions that we're seeing between uh, Prigozhin as well as the Russian military? Katya, I know you could talk about this for about three days, uh, but I'll kick it over to you. <laughs> yeah, it's been a very busy Prigozhin uh, week, uh, especially with his uh, recent uh, meltdowns. Yeah, Prigozhin, Prigozhin's rise and his start uh, came to be around uh, the same time that I mentioned um, when Putin had the decision to whether mobilize or not to mobilize. It was around the fall of Severodonetsk and Misichansk, where Putin turned to irregular forces rather than uh, mobilizing, again, in fear for his regime. Um, at that point, uh, Prigozhin and Wagner forces have already fought in the Popasna area and have, uh, have also had some assault formations fight in Severodonetsk campaign as well and might have proven to Putin that you know, they, they could achieve some, um, some advancements. Uh, they did not fight alone. They did fight alongside Chechen units and conventional Russian forces. Uh, so do not believe for one second uh, to any Prigozhin lie that he can achieve anything by himself. Uh, and that his Wagner forces can achieve anything by themselves as well. The root of this problem and this conflict really came um, around uh, the time when uh, Russia was suffering significant military um, issues. And Prigozhin seized that opportunity to elevate himself and kind of promote his brand, uh, push for legalization of his forces, um, as well as make uh, political strides, uh, namely trying to remove St. Petersburg governor um, Alexander Beglov, some Yekaterinburg museum heads. Uh, he was going after a lot of things. He was asking for a lot. There was a time in around October where he did have some leverage. Um, we have Western intelligence confirming that he was one of the individuals that did go to Putin and say, look, Kharkiv was a mistake and it was a disaster. Let me come in and let me sort this out. Your military is a sham. And that's when we saw the removal of Lapin from uh, Alexander Lapin, who was commander of central uh, forces in Ukraine, um, also alongside with Prigozhin in Luhansk Oblast, who he likely didn't like, um, as well as you know Chechen leader Ramzan Kandyrov also coming out against Lapin. Um, and then we also have the appointment of Sergei Surovikin as the general commander of this entire um, of the entire forces in, in uh, Ukraine. Uh, and Surovkin is said to be uh, an affiliate of uh, Wagner, and you know uh, Prigozhin did kind of confirm that he was giving a lot of weapons and ammunition to uh, Wagner uh, in his recent meltdowns. Now, where does it all go sour for Prigozhin? I think he actually got it, got it into a little bit over his head about his, his own significance and what he actually could achieve on the front lines. I think there was a time where Putin or whoever likely realized that, you know, the capture of Bakhmut just solely with Wagner forces after they've been fighting in that area since um, at least since May and actually fighting there in um, August uh, was not happening. And probably he had some sort of de deadlines by which he needed to achieve this push and he didn't. And uh, that's where we started to see a Wagner being depleted of some of their privileges. Uh, namely the ammunition, uh, this whole scandal this, uh, over this week. Uh, but we also had um, reports that Wagner no longer can uh, recruit prisoners, uh, which was uh, a special privilege that other irregular formations did not get. So for example, LNR, DNR, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk uh, People's Republics or volunteer battalions, they didn't have prison, uh, prisoners participating alongside with them. Um, and then we also uh, saw some Ukrainian reports that Wagner did lose privileges to some of their training grounds that were operated by uh, Russian Ministry of Defense. Um, I think when the appointment of Gerasimov really came into place, that's when we saw a real displacement of Wagner out of this area of influence, but in, out of the, the general influence uh, that they have in the information space. Um, it is important to note that Wagner had constructed, con constructed this ultra-nationalist uh, uh, network um, online in, on Russian internet essentially for years and years that later helped them recruit for um, other Russian campaigns in Syria and Mali and so on. 
And it's no surprise that um, now we're seeing a lot of um, times where Russian MOD refuses to recognize that Wagner participated in a capture of a settlement around Bakhmut. And it's, it's a deliberate campaign to push aside Prigozhin, both in the information space, but also on the front lines that we're seeing in Bakhmut. Um, and finally, I will leave with uh, one more uh, note, is that the Wagner attack around Bakhmut um, showed that Prigozhin is really not able to accomplish much. Um, he now is fighting alongside with uh, Russian Vadova forces um, and other mobilized and DNR and so on. And it shows to us that, you know, he had this opportunity to achieve something. He had a lot of supplies to do it. He had Putin's support on his side, but he wasn't able to do this. Um, you know, convict forces, uh, I believe the, the breakdown was something like 50,000, uh, 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 it was 50,000 general, and then 10 of them were previous special forces and commanders uh, that had military experience, and then others were convicts. That force was not sustainable, um, that force was not effective. His tactics of using his forces was not successful. And ultimately, we're now seeing um, the Russian MOD prevail and micromanage irregular formations on the front lines and trying to seize the opportunity to professionalize its army. No, certainly, it'll take them a long road to do so. Um, thank you all for the excellent questions. Uh, we're having to be mindful on time here, just a few more minutes. George, you've been looking very closely at Belarus ever since the protests back in 2020. Um, what is your view on the prospect of the Russians undertaking the most dangerous course of action of a new front from Belarus? Yeah, we, we have long assessed that it's very unlikely that the Russians will again attempt uh, an attack against northern Ukraine from Belarus. Belarus is essentially a giant a training ground. It used to be a staging ground for the initial phase when the Russians overestimated their capabilities, but it is no longer that. Uh, the Russians, they've learned the hard way that they cannot take Kiev, uh, and they're actually in a much more space to be able to do it now than they were before. They're not going to reattempt it, and um, for logistical and operational reasons, it's actually quite difficult to attack Ukraine from Belarus. The Russians are sending a lot of their guys to Belarus for a twofold reasons. Reason number one, they need to train. We know that the, Belarus, uh, the Russians have uh, committed uh, trainers from their own service academies uh, and personnel who work uh, in training units at training grounds to actually go fight in Ukraine. We've seen their obituaries where you know, faculty from service academies have been promoted to be a battalion commander and then they end up killed in Ukraine later, which indicates that the Russians are eating their own seed corn and therefore are likely using the Belarusian trainers who have long been conducting joint exercises with the Russians, who have a joint doctrine with the Russians, who have all the same standard operating procedures. They're using them to train all these mobilized guys and so on and so forth. The second reason why the Russians are deploying forces to Belarus perpetually is to perpetuate this Russian information operation that the Russians will attack, Belarus, uh, will attack from Belarus into Ukraine. And the purpose for perpetuating that narrative is in order to provoke fear and uncertainty in Ukraine and in the West about the prospects for the Russian war. They want us to think that they have options and ways to escalate, that they could always go for the throat, um, and that, frankly, that Ukraine has to therefore divert resources to an irrelevant part of the front, or rather an irrelevant area of the country that is not even the front, and prevent the Ukrainians from amassing their forces in a place where they actually could be decisive, like in the east or in the south. Um, so uh, yeah, it's very unlikely. Yeah, though certainly keeping an eye on it uh, and keeping track of any indications of if the Russians do uh, very foolishly uh, move towards that. Relatedly, uh, We'll do a very quick answer on this one, and I'll do some closing comments. Uh, speaking of other areas that the Russians are unlikely able to do something, what is the prospect of uh, any sort of subversion in Moldova? I'll post this to any of y'all. I forget who wrote about this earlier this week. Um, I, I think it's very, it's very unlikely. It's, it's an extreme case scenario. Uh, the Russians, listen, there's been a lot of things that the Russians have, have done in the war that have surprised us because it was not the smart thing to do. It was not the intelligent thing to do, but they did it anyway. But the Russian forces that are in Moldova, they're, they're, they're quite poor. Uh, there's two battalions, the Western Military District, that are completely isolated, unsupported. They're there guarding a very large Soviet-era ammunition depot. Um, 
quite frankly, those two battalions are an easy snack for the permanent Ukrainian de de brigades that are deployed near Odessa. Um, they would be foolish. The Russians would be foolish to try to do anything because uh, I think the the Russians would lose a they have a, they run a very high chance of potentially losing this strategic little enclave that they've carved in Moldova. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you all so much uh, for your time today and the excellent questions. We hope this was valuable. Um, I just want to close out by reiterating how important it is uh, and how much of an honor it has been, frankly, to see the uh, reception that we have gotten. Um, we're a very small team. When the war started, this was it. The four of us were the ones that wrote the very first updates uh, in February and March of early last year. We've expanded now to there's nine of us, uh, and we're continuing to grow further, and we are going to be documenting this war through our updates and our controlled terrain maps and other pieces as long as it takes, um, and continuing to provide the data-driven and objective analysis that is ISW's hallmark, uh, while also, you know, we hope uh, trying to demonstrate the importance, uh, both for Ukraine and for the United States, of allowing Ukraine to not simply somewhat retake its occupied territory or fight to a ceasefire that the Russians uh, will then try to manipulate as they have done in the past, but to secure a lasting uh, victory for Ukraine that will harden it against any renewed Russian aggression. That's all we've got. Thank you all so much. We're going to have a brief break here before the second panel this afternoon. Uh, and once again, thank you so much for your attention and the excellent questions.
We good? Ladies and gentlemen, please, please take your seats. We'll begin the second panel. Thank you so much for joining us once again this afternoon. Before we uh, begin the next panel, we have the great honor today um, of hearing from uh, the Ambassador of Ukraine to the United States, Her Excellency Oksana Markarova. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for joining us. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here and speak briefly, and I promise to be very brief, before this excellent panel that I look forward to hearing from each uh, on the stage because I think these people, all of you, have not only been uh, super experts, but you have been super friends of Ukraine. And, and it's very important. On this day when we talk about one year mark of a full-fledged phase of this war and almost nine year of the time when Russia attacked us the first time. Why it is important to talk about what lies ahead? Why it is important to strategize and think how the future should look like? Because as people who believe in the same principles and values, as people who believe in democracy and independence, as people who believe that other people, Ukrainians in this case, should be able to decide how we want to live, should be able to decide who do we choose as presidents, who do we choose as the, our neighbors uh, to be friends with and which alliances to join, it should not be the same for us what is the outcome of this? Because the outcome of this war, of this brutal attack of large authoritarian nuclear state against peaceful, much smaller country that never posed any threat to Russia is of course existential for Ukraine, but it's also existential for all democracies who want to clearly tell their citizens that not only they can deliver better, not only they can provide much better life for their citizens, but they can also defend them against these brutal attacks. So one year ago, we all got together a number of times and throughout this year, we discussed a number of times, what does Ukraine need in order to stand and hold the line? What does Ukraine need in order to get to another month or liberate a little bit more territory or return more people back home. Today, we have to discuss only one thing. And I think we have to realize that the situation is really black and white. Mm -hmm. We have to discuss what do we have to do for Ukraine to win? What do we have to do for Ukraine to win fast? And what do we have to do to defeat Russia? Because the question of accountability and paying for what Russia has done not only the war crimes, horrible war crimes in Ukraine, not only the atrocities, but the very crime of aggression, the fact that they have decided to attack and they executed that attack has to be punished by the international community. Only then we will be able to restore the international rule of law. Only then we will be able to restore the international security infrastructure, which has been shattered by Russia's attack in 2014, and even more so by the Russia attacks in 2022. So uh, I would like to close by thanking the American Enterprise Institute and the Institute of Study of War, first of all, for excellent analysis and making all of us think ahead and making all of us think more about how and what can be done I would like to thank uh, the Institute of Study of War, especially for your excellent information and, and maps. Uh, this has been the guiding articles in Ukraine for so many people and probably the most referenced 
uh, maps and, and the uh, situational awareness uh, updates. I would like to thank Americans, President Biden, Congress on a very strong bipartisan basis, all American people for this support. We wouldn't be able to be where we are today without this support. And we will always remember what the US has done to us and this help in our fight for independence, because this is what it is. And I know that we will win. The question is not if we will win, but the question is when and how many lives we will be able to save before we win. And just to finish, it's also time to start talking about how after we will win in this war, we can win in the peace. How Ukraine can not only rebuild and reconstruct what has been destroyed, but how we can build something much better, innovative, something that will inspire the world again, like we're inspiring now by the way we fight, how the young, vibrant democracy can build something extraordinary in the economic uh, and financial area. And as the former minister of finance and finance here, this is something that gets me really excited. Like I really want to start working on that rather than learning something more about additional items uh, of the weapons and, and something like this. So please continue the support. Please write to your congressmen, senators. Please make very public remarks about the fact that we need to stay the course. More weapons, more support to Ukraine, more sanctions and isolations to Russia, and we can faster get to just peace and to this very inspiring phase of the reconstruction and create creation, recreation of new successful economically prosperous Ukraine. God bless America, and Slava Ukraini. Ambassador, thank you so much. So it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce and then uh, lead uh, the afternoon's panel. We'll zoom out a little bit and talk about the, some of the geostrategic issues and the future of Russia, uh, which is also uh, a matter of great concern to all of us in many ways. Uh, we have a terrific panel this afternoon. It's a panel of good friends. Um, beginning with uh, Leon Aron, uh, senior fellow here uh, with me at the American Enterprise Institute uh, and one of the nation's foremost experts on Russia. Uh, Dalibor uh, Rohach, another <coughs> of my colleagues here uh, at AEI um, and an expert on Eastern Europe, uh, an area that has become absolutely essential in the public consciousness, it's always actually been more important than most people realized, um, but it's now become obviously important, and Dalibor has done a terrific job uh, with that. Um, one of AEI's newest additions to our roster, Senator uh, Portman. Uh, we are thrilled, very sorry that the Senate uh, has uh, lost you, but very delighted that uh, AEI has gained in the exchange um, and thrilled to have you uh, here. And my very good friend, um, Natalia Bugayova, uh, who is a Russia analyst at the Institute for the Study of War and played a very important role uh, in ISW's development, but also in the construction of the superlative Russia team uh, at ISW that uh, Mason inherited and then has taken to amazing new heights. So thank you all for, uh, for joining us today. So Leon, let's, uh, let's start by talking about why uh, Putin started this war, because of course, we should start with Russia since Russia started the entire crisis. Uh, Putin cited all kinds of justifications for the invasion, but what were his real motivations? Were there domestic imperatives driving him? Absolutely. Um, I will give you at least three. Uh, the first one is that, um, uh, it was not a neutral Ukraine he was after. He was after a failed Ukraine because a Ukraine uh, looking towards the West, eventually, by fits and starts, um, prosperous, stable, 
democratic, uh, was a mortal danger to the regime. Because uh, at one point or another, the Russian people would say, well, why can't we have what they have? Especially because you, President Putin, have been telling us they're fraternal people. Uh, why um, are they uh, like that? They're free and, and eventually prosperous and stable, and we're not. The second reason is that, remember, Fred, uh, you probably know better than anybody, that war is an autocrat's dream. Um, <laughs> a besieged fortress Russia is no longer a metaphor, or at least it's, it's a metaphor leaping alive. Um, what elections? Uh, what freedom of speech? What rule of law? What property rights? Of course, Putin has uh, had been undermining those things uh, from the very beginning, but now he has given himself a carte blanche um, to extirpate them completely. Uh, the war, uh, in essence, allowed Putin to complete a, a classic reactionary restoration that he was after from the first day of his presidency. And um, uh, today we have uh, the so-called economic mobilization, meaning uh, militarized, state-run, for the most part, industry. We'll have a Gosplan probably very soon. Um, we are uh, back to the young pioneers. Uh, Komsomolis should not be too far back. And um, the children are studying uh, Soviet history by essentially Soviet textbooks. Uh, and let me give you another, the final third reason. And that is um, in 2012, for, the, for um, uh, the reasons that we're not gonna go into it, Putin chose um, to replace economic progress and uh, growth of incomes that cemented his, had cemented his popularity in the first two terms um, with um, a militarized patriotism. War or a threat of war became the key to his legitimacy. And uh, you, know, you settled that tiger, and uh, he actually made it trot rather expertly in the right direction, but the problem with that mode of transportation is that it requires meat. <laughs> um, and it requires meat, the, the warmer, um, the, the bloodier, the better, and it's very difficult to dismount. So I think these are at least three reasons to start this war. Thank you, Leon. I can't, I can't resist observing of the metaphor of Putin and the tiger. <laughs> that I, I believe that the first victims of the actual tiger were in China when, it, when it, the, one of his tigers crossed into China and started devouring herds uh, there. So the Chinese might want to think about how close they want to get to, to the guy riding the tiger. I should uh, also say, by the way, please email uh, questions to the uh, address on the screen. I'm not going to be designating uh, people to facilitate uh, having a good combination of virtual uh, engagement and room in the presence. So please email your questions. Um, Leon, let's, the image of Putin dismounting this tiger is an interesting one. Let's talk a little bit more about how the war might end and, and perhaps what that dismount might look like. Um, war is going badly for him, obviously. And there are reports, always unconfirmable, insiders, sources, and so forth, that his inner circle is unhappy. Domestic pressure or domestic factors encouraged him to launch this war. Might domestic pressures cause him to try to end it? Uh, they had better. They had better, um, uh, Fred, because otherwise we get into all sorts of uh, uh, rather uh, scary scenarios. Look, uh, now that this war uh, has moved into the attrition stage, um, the... the um, Battle of the armies, the, the uh, contest on the battlefield, uh, of course, continues to be important, and we are in awe of the skill and bravery of, of, of uh, Ukrainian soldiers and, and the entire Ukrainian nation. But the key contest is occurring um, and will get even more intense um, between the offices of the leaders uh, in the Kremlin, on the one hand, and of course in Washington and the European capitals. Um, Putin is betting uh, on the West wearing of supporting Ukraine and therefore pressing it for a peace settlement, largely on Russia's term. And West's hope in those capitals that I mentioned um, is a mirror image of Putin's, which is that the price in blood and treasure um, will force him to uh, uh, eventually negotiate in earnest. Now, uh, going in, Putin, uh, of course, um, 
enjoys a traditional, the traditional advantage of an authoritarian over democracy because democracies want peace and Putin wants victory. Um, so that is um, already uh, uh, there. Uh, does that mean that he's invulnerable? Of course not, of course not. Um, it, as I mentioned in his uh, presidential term, uh, third presidential term, he chose war uh, or the threat of war um, as, as the key to his legitimacy. And uh, he became uh, a, a kind of a, uh, uh, you know, wartime president, Vladimir the Vanquisher, sort of like <laughs> Russia's uh, patron saint, George the Victorious, you know, uh, spearing the NATO dragon that writhes uh, under the hoofs of his steed. But, but that is precisely the problem now because, uh, as always in such situations, um, the greatest damage, even long term, you don't see it right away, is in tarnished symbols and discredited official mythology. Uh, he made um, uh, the victory in World War II, or the Great Patriotic War, as the Russians call it, um, the greatest event in uh, uh, Russian history. And of course, uh, May 9th is now by far the most important holiday. Um, and the invasion of Ukraine, too, was yoked to this 77-year-old victory. It's, uh, he went there ostensibly to denazify Ukraine. But the similarity ends there. There's no victory day inside. So, so uh, yes, we know that most people are supporting him. And, and even with the uh, uh, you know, obvious problems with the polling in authoritarian societies, I, I do believe that's the case. But like with the sanctions, it's too early. It's too early. Yes, there's the rally around the flag. Uh, but that's because people are in this sort of frenzy of, of uh, patriotic euphoria. They believe that, well, one year, you know, all those boys are not uh, dying in vain because it's only been one year and soon we will win. Well, as the war goes in, um, will, will that rally around the flag uh, begin to thin out? I think it will. The bottom line is this, Fred. Um, whether Putin feels he can afford politically a retreat, much less a defeat. And let's hope that, that he would think that, that he can afford it. Because as I said, uh, other means of extricating himself from this war are, are a bit scary to think about. So people are also talking about the possibility that he bets wrong one way or another. And particularly, people have raised the issue that a Russian defeat could prompt regime change in Moscow. Um, and after all, military defeats in Russia are prone to do that when they happen on a large enough scale. Do you think that that is possible here? Well, um, you're right. Uh, the, the sort of uh, Russian history pointed to a, a rather unforgiving nature of the gods of Russian history. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and they are pretty tough on military defeats or setbacks. I mean, we had the Crimean War, 1853-56, um, followed by re essentially regime change with the Alexander II Revolution from above. Uh, four decades later, the loss in the Russo-Japanese War led to essentially, well, the October Manifesto, the first Russian Revolution, and sort of moved towards a constitutional monarchy. The abdication of Nicholas I followed the setbacks in World War I. Khrushchev was ousted uh, two years after he retreated from Cuba. And of course, and of course um, um, uh, Afghanistan, the guagmire of Afghanistan, contributed to Gorbachev's perestroika. But here's the problem, uh, uh, Fred. Uh, all of those uh, things, all of those changes of regime happened in a situation where there were institutions and individuals that if not precipitating the change, they certainly urged it along. I mean, obviously Alexander II was a legitimate heir, but even in uh, 1905, um, uh, there was a relative freedom of speech and there was a relative, um, uh, relatively, if unformed, but, but present opposition. Of course, in 1917, when uh, Nicholas abdicated, there was, there was the Duma, and, and of course, uh, in uh, uh, 1985 or 1988, 
um, when the uh, troops withdrew from um, Afghanistan, there was the office of the general secretary and the man by the name of Mikhail Gorbachev. Now, Putin has left behind an absolutely uh, burnt out political field. Um, there is, um, it's scorched earth politically. Um, you can get out the biggest and the most powerful magnifying glass and start looking for <laughs> anybody who could challenge him. And, uh, and I don't think you'll see anybody. Now, when we talk about changes of regime in authoritarian societies, the first thing is the military. Uh, well, in addition to the weirdness of the Russian military, uh, after almost uh, exactly two centuries since the Decemberist revolt, um, they tried to stay away from, from uh, getting involved into politics. But this war also has demonstrated how Putin selects his generals. Uh, have you seen anybody uh, with ambition, skill, uh, brains? Uh, <laughs> no, no. And, and if they do, do appear, they immediately removed. Um, so the military is not a threat. Um, he finished off the civil society. The key opposition leaders, um, Valody Karamurza, um, Navalny, uh, Ilya Yashin, are safely locked up. And uh, the second most powerful man in Russia, I think, um, uh, the Secretary of um, Security Council, Nikolai Patrushev, makes Putin looks like a liberal softy. Um, he is a total monster. So, so I don't think there is, there is a change at the moment. Uh, that there is there is something pending. Now, the the um, again, let me say that this is this is not the end. This does not mean that um, the um, uh, he's invulnerable. We have to wait uh, for the people. Uh, I'm afraid that, that, that there is no. I can't once. There is, there is a movement that I described. Once there is a, a, the beginning of the doubt, um, national doubt in this war, I don't think even his uh, you know, Praetorian guard under his former bodyguard, Viktor Zolotov, 340,000 uh, National Guard, or whatever is left of it after Ukraine, um, I, I don't think they will be um, terribly effective. There's one, I, I, should, I should leave you with, with some hope. So uh, we are all, frequently told that the next guy is going to be even worse. Well, again, that's, that could be true, but also, um, you know, the Russian history is, is not is ambivalent on that score. I mean, we, we um, you know, we had uh, Mikhail Romanov uh, and uh, Boris Godunov after uh, Ivan the Terrible. We had uh, Catherine the Great after uh, about four decades since Peter the Great's death, and, and minus you know some some idiots and perverts in between, but 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 there she was, and of course um, uh, you know Paul the uh, First was was uh, replaced by uh, by his son Alexander the First, who started communing with with a very liberal, probably the first uh, uh, Russian liberal reformer, Mikhail Speransky, and of course Stalin uh, was followed by by Khrushchev, and and uh, Gorbachev followed Brezhnev. So, so uh, it's not hopeless, but it is going to be, I think, a, a very tough slog. Thank you, Leon. Uh, this is a very important observation. I, I share your skepticism that Putin will be imminently uh, overthrown. Among other things, I would point out that Nicholas II abdicated and Gorbachev, in effect, abdicated, lost their will. They were not overthrown, per se. They lost their will to continue uh, to fight. I don't see that happening with Putin. And so I think that we need to take down the temperature a little bit in our own discourse about the imminent threat of some collapse in Russia that would somehow be horrible, and the even stranger artifact in our own discussion that somehow it is in our interest to prolong Putin's reign uh, by slowing or limiting Ukraine's victory because somehow we are certain that we can affect that materially, which is a very strange position to hold indeed, and that somehow it will be inevitably worse uh, whenever Putin falls, because we forget Putin will be replaced. He is not immortal, even though he is drinking the blood from deer antlers and so forth. <laughs> he will be replaced, and so we need to understand there will be a post-Putin Russia, and we should reflect on that when we talk about this, uh, these kinds of decisions. 
And Natalia, on the subject of the future of Russia, I want now to come to you and ask you uh, about the future of Russia's power. There are some who are arguing that Russia has already been significantly weakened by the war. So the United States would see only moderate benefits from further weakening its adversary. Do you agree? Um, thank you, Fred. Uh, no, I do not agree, and I think it's a very dangerous assumption to base policy on. Russia is weakened, but its goals remain the same. Um, Kremlin still seeks to strip Ukraine um, essentially of its sovereignty, and Leon said that Putin went after uh, not neutral Ukraine, but failed Ukraine. I would say Putin went for no Ukraine as a state. Uh, Putin still intends to control neighboring countries like Be Belarus. And Russia still aims to um, try to neutralize NATO as well as undermine U.S. Uh, as, a great, as a global power. Um, and finally, Putin was very explicit that he intends to rebuild Russia's large-scale conventional um, fighting capability. Whether Russia will be able to act on any of that uh, disproportionately depends on whether Russia can keep its gains in Ukraine. Because if Russia does keep its gains in Ukraine, it will be able to rebuild. It will have a chance to rebuild. It will most certainly attack Ukraine again. Uh, it will uh, very likely try to link its military gains in Ukraine and, and in Belarus. Uh, that would impose um, tremendous requirements on the United States, uh, on NATO, on, on the EU, um, and uh, also create additional vulnerabilities, especially as we're thinking about long-term competition with China. Um, I also want to say that if Russia keeps its gains in Ukraine, its narratives around the world uh, will proliferate, and as well as its anti-U.S. coalition. Um, and U.S. is risking to be um, drawn in the same problem uh, when Russia attacks again in this scenario, but under much worse conditions and with the same escalation risks. I think, uh, Fred, the, the street goes both ways. If, if Russia loses its gains in Ukraine, then already limited uh, basis of Russia's power will further be degraded, be it its influence in the former Soviet states, uh, be it its um, global influence, because um, Russia's value add that it can offer to its partners, in this case, be it the weapons it can provide or, or the narrative it's trying to sell, all of that will be diminished. And um, kind of tying it back to what Liang was saying, I do think that in, in, this, in the first scenario, if Russia keeps gain, you know, Putin uh, very likely will have a very strong shot to sustain his power, and also uh, Putinism will continue. If Russia loses gains, uh, the pressure on Putin domestically will tremendously increase because it is actually not the people who don't support the war that Putin needs to worry about. It's, it's the people who do because he is relying on that broader nationalist base to both sustain his regime and also continue uh, the war. So there's a lot of discussion in the West also about the need to avoid a protracted war. And of course, no one wants a protracted war. And the tension that some people see and articulate between the desire to end the war quickly and the desire to help Ukraine liberate more of its people and land. How do you see that question? Yeah, I think it's another dangerous assumption to think that we somehow can avoid a long war without helping Ukraine further liberate its terrain. Um, precisely because territory matters, uh, and territory is a core part of Russia's capability to sustain this war. And we actually should start thinking about territory as a part of Russia's military capability along the lines of manpower and um, defense industrial base. Uh, any territory that Russia keeps in Ukraine, it will use to launch future attacks. We actually don't need to hypothesize. We know we're, we know Russian strategy because we're living it. Any territory that Russia keeps in Ukraine will become um, a Russian military base, likely in perpetuity. Uh, imagine how much further Russia can move if it keeps um, additional gains in Ukraine or present gains in Ukraine, and also how much harder it will be on Ukrainians to defend essentially this uh, vast of a front line. Um, and finally, I know we're uh, discussing a lot from, from the perspective of U.S. national interest, but anyone who's suggesting um, giving up some of Ukraine's land um, in exchange for whatever benefit they think they will gain should be very clear and explicit that they understand this course of action uh, condemns everyone living on those territories to perpetual uh, Russian atrocities. So I think actually deprioritizing terrain is exactly what's going to get us into the long war. Thank you. Um, what we can we can point out we when we're being careful we say the reinvasion of Ukraine 
this year because, of course, the first invasion of Ukraine was in 2014, and the war never stopped. Um, I used to tell us our joke, what do you call it when the uh, mechanized artillery, air forces, air defense forces, missile forces, rocket forces of two countries fight each other. In Ukraine, we call it a ceasefire. That was true until 2022. So this war has already lasted eight years. And the question really is how many more years we would like it to last, understanding that a ceasefire hasn't ended war, any war that Russia has been involved in, but has simply set conditions uh, for the future. Nevertheless, it's very understandable that a lot of people are calling for negotiations to end the conflict. It's a little less understandable to me, anyway, that some are focusing on forcing Ukraine uh, to negotiate. I think the larger challenge is getting Putin to negotiate on any basis that Ukraine and the West should accept. But is this even the right framework for thinking about bringing an acceptable end to this war, Natalia? Yeah, I think t two points. One is I think we should start reorienting U.S. policy from... Um, trying to change Putin's mind to actually trying to deprive Russia of the capability to, to wage war in Ukraine. Uh, and second, we shouldn't self-deter. And um, Mason on the previous panel already started uh, elaborating on that point. So on the first point, um, Russia's intent is inflexible. Uh, we said it many times today, and it's also evidenced by years of Putin's actions and, and words. Um, and policies that presume or presuppose that there's some amount of land that we can uh, give Putin to change his mind and dissuade him from attacking Ukraine, I think are policies that are hoping we can change Russia's objectives in Ukraine, which is just that. It's a policy based on hope, uh, not facts. And I think uh, the, the good news is that, fortunately, it's not just about Russia's intent. Uh, it's a lot more so about Russia's capability and the US, Ukraine, and Ukraine's partners already had a lot of success in um, depriving Russia of capability to act on its intent and have a lot of agency in shaping Russia's capability um, going forward. You know, let's not forget that the reason Russians are not occupying Kiev right now is not because Putin changed his mind and abandoned the goal to do so, it's because he was deprived uh, of the capability to do so. So I think for, as we look ahead, um, Policy shift should be to focus on uh, two things. One, helping Ukraine's counteroffensive succeed to deprive Russia of momentum, uh, of territory, but also of a breather to help it reconstitute its uh, manpower and separately targeting Russia's uh, capability globally and everything that helps uh, Russia amplify its defense industrial base, as well as the um, information operations. I think um, final point, and just very quickly on the self-deterrence, um, element. I think U.S. should not so deter and handicap its policy options. Ukraine is on track to liberate additional uh, territory and its people. It is in U.S. interest that Ukraine does it. Uh, U.S. should help Ukraine do just that and after that reassess options, but not before. And I think a lot of the narratives that we should uh, condition, uh, we should essentially promise or set expectation of having a negotiation um, is a very big present to Putin because it actually gives the Kremlin uh, an initiative in the information space. Um, and why would we self-deter? Why would we ha handicap our own options uh, when, when we don't have to yet? Thank you, Natalia. I, this issue of negotiations, I think, is very, very important. And I think there are some confusion in our, dis in our discussion about what is involved, how wars end, because we're saying to ourselves all the time now, all wars end in negotiations. That's actually only sort of true. There are plenty of wars that have not ended in negotiations, but have ended with one side imposing its will by force on the other. Um, but there are negotiations, and then again, there are negotiations. And I think people have too much in their minds a model of the Balkans in the 90s or of Ukraine Minsk Accords after 2014, where neither side has achieved its objectives and then the international community persuades both sides to lock themselves in a room together, not beat each other up somehow, and, and come out with a peace agreement that resolves things. But this isn't that kind of war. This is a conventional mechanized invasion of conquest. I'm actually hard pressed to think of any such a war that ended with Dayton style negotiations or Minsk II Accords. And I think that we're using words too loosely in general in this discourse, and particularly the idea of negotiations. This is the kind of war I think, as Natalia has said very eloquently, will likely end with a negotiation that recognizes facts on the ground as they are. 
And that is something that I think we need to wrap our heads around a little bit more. Of course, the issue of negotiation is extremely central to American willingness to support, but even more so to European uh, willingness to support and also hesitancy. So let me come now to, uh, to Dalibor and ask Dalibor, please, t talk to me a little bit about the short-term threats that you see to Europe's resolve to help Ukraine and keep pressure on Russia. Well, for, for, thank you. I have both good news and, and, and some bad news. But before I get into those, uh, let me just preface that by, by saying that I'm not a big one for pathos or sentimentality, much less self-congratulation on a day like this. But I don't think I've ever been prouder to work at AEI than today. The support for Ukraine and, and, and the ability to distinguish between good and evil in this conflict uh, should not be a controversial proposition on the, on the center-right. And I'm very grateful for this organization, and I say that recognizing that we don't have institutional positions on things, but to share the stage with Senator Portman, with you, Fred, with Natalia, and, and Leon, and with Ukraine's ambassador, uh, is, 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 makes me very grateful for, for the existence of this, of this, of this organization. Uh, now, on the, on, the, on the good news front, I think the um, most encouraging piece of, of, of news coming from Europe is over the past year really has been the emergence of uh, what former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld loosely called New Europe. You have a new iteration of New Europe, if you will. Uh, countries from Central and Eastern Europe, Baltics, uh, Nordics, that recognize that what is at stake in Ukraine is of existential nature to, to, to themselves. And we've seen many manifestations of this, uh, of this coalition, most recently in the form of the Leopard Coalition that has also brought in support from, from, from Germany, obviously, but also from Canada, uh, Spain, Portugal, and, and, and other countries. And, and there, I think there's a real sense of purpose uh, behind this, 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 this grouping of countries that, that perhaps uh, might uh, make you know U.S. Con policymakers consider you know who, who their most relevant counterparts on on, on these matters are uh, in 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 Europe. Uh, the European Union as a whole has maintained a rather impressive sense of unity at many junctures. So so the EU has either already approved. I haven't checked my my phone uh, in the past past half an hour, or is very close to approving the tenth package of sanctions against Russia, which will include sanctions on uh, individuals involved in the uh, illegal deportations of Ukrainian children, and uh, sanctions, basically uh, bans on all exports from entities involved uh, in, in Iran that are involved in supplying Russia with with, with items uh, that, that Russians are using in the war. Uh, also, in the United States, the, the debate about uh, you know, how much the Europeans have done, I think, focuses uh, predominantly and, and not always helpfully on, 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 on the, um, you know, the, the relative hard power impotence of, of, of European countries at the expense of some of the very real adjustments that have already happened, for example, in the sector of energy, where uh, very impressively Germany has not imported uh, Russian natural gas in any quantity since, since October. There have been irreversible changes done to, to Europe's energy infrastructure in a way that will make a going back to business as usual very difficult in the, in the future. And I think those are all uh, very encouraging trends that, that we, should, we should certainly cheer on and, and, and try to encourage from this side of the Atlantic. Now, there are some you know, weak links in all those processes. Ten days ago, uh, Hungary's foreign minister, uh, Siarto, went to Minsk to compare notes with his Belarusian counterpart and, <laughs> and possibly with, uh, with, 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 with Russian representatives <laughs> as well. Uh, Viktor Orban uh, has not explicitly vetoed successive packages of sanctions, but he is at home campaigning very openly uh, against the, the existing sanctions regime, blaming the whole situation on Brussels, on Western policymakers. Uh, he has vowed to his voters to, to dismantle the sanctions regime and to, to go back to some form of business as usual. Um, you know, looking west, uh, there is Austria, 
you know, the current Austrian government, uh, you know, on this particular issue is probably the best that we are going to have. Uh, the predecessor of the current foreign minister, uh, uh, Mikhail Schoenberger, Karin Kneisel, had Vladimir Putin as the guest of honor at, at her wedding some years ago while she was serving as, as the foreign minister. <coughs> Today, 18 uh, members of the Duma are visiting Vienna for an OSC meeting, and they might be attending a ball of the FPÖ, the Freedom Party, over the weekend. The FPÖ is polling first in in Austrian polls. So, so, so I think that those are, you know, some some of the less less encouraging pieces of news. And obviously, if you look to France, you see an embattled president who is struggling to get his pension reform across. If he fails, he might become, you know, a lame duck president. Not everybody in this room might like President Macron's leadership, uh, but I think we should all be conscious of, of, of the fact that the alternatives are much, much worse. Uh, to me, the single most important source of uncertainty, the, the, the real wild card, though, is the United States. I think if there is one lesson from, from this past year, it is uh, that, you know, for all my enthusiasm for the European project, uh, Europe does need US leadership. Uh, the current sense of unity and purpose, when, when you talk to people in Brussels and elsewhere uh, on, on, on this particular issue, would not be possible, first of all, without Ukrainian successes on the battlefield, and secondly, without the, the support and leadership shown by, uh, by, 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 by the United States, including by the, by the Biden administration. And uh, you know, on, on many fronts, there have been mixed, uh, mixed messages being sent both by the administration. There have been you know, fissures in the, in, the, in, the, in the GOP that we might get into. And all of those, I think, should make us, at the very least, nervous, but, but, but certainly much more determined in, 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 in making the argument for why Ukraine matters to the United States and to Europe. Thank you, Dalibor. And thank you for making an excellent point that we can't treat European will to do things as independent from American will to do things. And as we Americans want Europe to do more, and of course we want Europe to do more, uh, it's also important to remember that leaders lead and that the United States created a global alliance system, which it is the leader. And the members of that alliance system look to the United States to take their cue. And if whenever we look back to them instead and say, well, we would like you to take the lead, uh, that's not the way this system is built. And so our leadership has been essential. The leadership of the Biden administration thus far has been critical. And I and thank you, Donald, for, for making that excellent point. So Ambassador Markarova recalled us to a happier notion of uh, Ukraine after the war finally ends and the idea of rebuilding Ukraine and with a lot of optimism that I think is very justified, that Ukraine has a huge amount of potential uh, if it can rid itself of the Russian bear and be safe. Um, but it will need a lot of help in that reconstruction. That will be a massive undertaking because the Russians have deliberately sought to destroy Ukraine in every way that they could. Europeans are going to have to play a big role in that. Dalibor, what do you think? Uh, do the Europeans understand how big that commitment is? Do you think that they will be willing to do their part? I think it's first, first worth stressing how, how much of a central role does the EU membership play in Ukraine's new sense of, of national identity, particularly after the revolution of dignity uh, of, of 2014. The Ukrainians have made very clear, very conscious choice about the sort of country they want to become, about extricating themselves from the legacies of the post-Soviet past and becoming a free, democratic European country firmly embedded in Western alliances in the, in the, in the European Union. Uh, and the war itself, uh, and paradoxically, has accelerated those efforts. Uh, Ukraine has been granted candidate status. Uh, the European institutions, particularly the European Commission, have been very good on this, on this particular, particular issues. But there are a couple of wrinkles that I think need need addressing in, in, a, in a very direct way. The, the first and most important one is that before uh, the, the, the war that started last year, the, the 2000, 
22 full-fledged invasion of Ukraine, uh, there, was, there had been relatively little appetite for, for enlarging the EU and Paris or, 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 or Berlin. President Macron was, was very vocal about that, in, particularly in reference to the Western Balkans, where you have candidate countries that have had that candidate status for you know, decades in some cases, while making very little progress towards, uh, towards, towards EU membership. And Ukraine itself fought that inertia uh, of, of, of European institutions and, and European leaders itself over questions such as visa-free access to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the Schengen area. Uh, that, that, that it's a twofold problem. It's partly a problem of political will uh, and partly a problem of of the sort of institutionalized technocratic method that is applied to enlargements, uh, whereby countries are requested to uh, adopt you know, a big chunk of, of, of EU legislation, uh, set up their legal systems into compliance with the existing EU rules, negotiate and close individual chapters that pertain to the so-called lucky communautaire, and only then in a sort of binary and the way they become members, and only then they have access to the full uh, benefits of membership. Uh, and that approach hasn't really worked that well in you know places like like the like like the Western Balkans. Uh, and on top of that, I mean the, the sort of political challenge that that Ukraine's accession represents relative to the accession of these of these smaller nations uh, is is immense. I mean Ukraine's per capita income. In, 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 in real terms is roughly at the half of, of that of Bulgaria, which is currently the poorest EU member state. It's a, it, is, it is a country of 44 million. It's, it's, it's a large agricultural country uh, that, I mean, whose full-fledged EU membership would require many European countries, the sort of central core EU states, to, to you know, write big checks. And I'm not quite sure that Politicians in, 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 in those countries are making that case to their, to their own electorates. And, and there is a real risk whereby uh, Ukraine's being granted a candidate status does not lead to tangible progress towards, towards membership, which would lead to a sense of disillusionment, if not um, you know, justified bitterness at, at the EU. And I think that's something that should wake. European policymakers up at night, and it certainly is waking me up at night. Uh, and, and for the US policymakers, I don't think there is any single bigger task than, than, than to really uh, compel Europeans to, to, to play their part on that front. I think this is far more important than the exact number of leopard tanks that get sent by the Germans or, or other European countries uh, tomorrow, however important that that issue is itself for, 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 for the EU and, and Europeans to, to be willing to, to, to play that part and not let you know, Ukraine fall into the indefinite limbo of negotiations and, and, and using, you know, crossing every T and dotting every I as, as an excuse for postponing some of the real benefits that could be extended to Ukraine already today, such as the access to the single market, such as the access to various education schemes, Erasmus programs, etc. I think this is the time for really thinking outside of the box and, and thinking creatively about what EU membership entails. And most importantly, I think it, 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 it goes back to this question of how this war ends, because it is really important that you know, Ukraine be able to recapture its full territory to preempt any excuse, which I already sort of see coming from some European quarters, which is to say, well, we can't really admit a country whose borders are disputed into the club. That would raise all sorts of issues. I mean, that's, you know, that's a sort of argument that, that some are willing to deploy. And I think that, that makes it all the more important for, for the, especially for the United States to, to, to maintain and, and increase its support for, for Ukraine on, on, on the military front. Thank you so much, Dalibor. So, Senator Portman, we come last to what is certainly not least important, which is the issue of American uh, will to continue to support this. Uh, there's a lot, huge amount of hand-wringing going on, of course, about the supposed loss of support and willingness among Republicans uh, for this. I promise not to uh, ask you to engage that directly because I think you share my hope and expectation that 
uh, when the Biden administration brings a bill uh, to Congress for support, the fringes will not uh, destroy the bipartisan uh, consensus that we've had behind doing the right thing. If you, if you disagree, please uh, correct me. But I think one of the issues that people have rightly been calling attention to is the concern that U.S. money or weapons provided to Ukraine might be going astray. And it's always a reasonable concern, in my view, uh, when the U.S. is providing a lot of cash and advanced weapon systems to another country. Um, and we've talked about this. I, I think if you could help our audience understand a little bit what measures are already in place to maintain accountability, and do you think, do we have reason to be concerned that weapons in particular are going astray? Well, thanks, Fred. Uh, let me start by echoing what uh, Talabar said, which is to thank AEI and all of you who are here, and of course the Institute uh, for the Study of War, because as you know, I've used your maps on 30 occasions on the Senate floor uh, to the point where people say, don't, Portman, don't put those, those maps up again. This is too much, but uh, never too much in, in my view. So thank you all. Um, and I want to, though, uh, hold most of my gratitude for the American people. And Ambassador, you said it well. I mean, we would not be in this situation of talking about how to find a potential uh, bargain with Russia, which frankly I think is is very difficult to do. Um, we would not be talking about a Ukraine that's still an independent, viable country, um, if not for the American people, ultimately. You know, the $100 billion plus, it's about $112 billion now as I add it up. Um, it's a lot of money. And um, without America's leadership, as Fred has alluded to, Natalia has talked about, um, we would not be in this position. If the Europeans left their own, their own devices uh, uh, after February 24th of, of last year, had, had been asked to step forward without our help. Um, uh, in my view, Kiev would have fallen, and uh, there would be a lot of hand-wringing and a lot of discussion um, and negotiation, but the country would be, in effect, occupied at this point. And so uh, I'm, I'm very appreciative that America has stepped forward, and ultimately it's, it is the American people. When the American uh, people are less supportive, which is starting to happen now, there's some Ukraine fatigue and we have to acknowledge it. Uh, that's when you see uh, that reflected in the body politic. And so I also congratulate my colleagues on both sides of the aisle who are standing firm uh, for all the right reasons, which we'll discuss later, I think, uh, I hope, about you know, what is the message? Why are, we, why are we doing this? And it's a moral message, but it's also a message about our national security. Uh, that's why it's so essential that, that we stay the course. But in terms of accountability, you all may recall that during the midterm elections, speaker-to-be, it turned out, Kevin McCarthy said that he did not believe that we should be giving Ukraine a blank check. And the media immediately took that to mean that he didn't support the effort in Ukraine. I was actually fine with that statement. Um, and there's no stronger supporter of Ukraine than me. Why? Because, again, this goes back to the American people. The taxpayers deserve to have an accounting of where their money is going, not just with regard to Ukraine, but with regard to so many <laughs> other places. And uh, the fact is, to respond directly, Fred, to your question, there is unprecedented accountability. And I say unprecedented relative to certainly other conflicts, but even with regard to so much money that's spent in our country for domestic purposes. And... Um, it doesn't mean we can't do more and shouldn't do more. It should not be a blank check. It should be one that uh, has attached to it the responsibility for the money to be accounted for. <coughs> and let me just whip through five different areas where this is currently happening. Again, could it be improved? Of course. But one, the IGs are doing a good job in my view. We put $50 million into this effort in addition to their current budgets for the IGs of AID, DOD, Department of Defense and Department of State, $50 million. And that's, I think, money well spent because they will continue to monitor closely. They just got back from Ukraine, as some of you know. They're actually developing memorandums of understanding with a number of the uh, Ukrainian uh, agencies and departments. Um, by the way, nobody wants this transparency more than President Zelensky. If you talk to him, he starts off by expressing his gratitude to the American people. 
and I've been to Ukraine, some of you know, over a dozen times. Um, and every conversation, that's, that's how he starts. That's what he said when he was here. But second, he says, you know what? I want this to be totally transparent. I want this money to be spent properly. I want it to go toward something that helps the Ukrainian people, of course. And you see he's taken some very uh, definitive actions against those he believed might not be using uh, dollars properly. Now, this was not Ukrainian officials who were using US dollars. It was actually Ukrainian uh, funding. But the point is, they really want this. Second, in addition to uh, the IGs and the monitoring that they're doing, which, by the way, they're reporting back to Congress. And they should do it in a more public way, in my view, so the American people can see it. And so those of my colleagues who are saying there's not adequate accountability have to answer the question, well, what's this? Um, but second, Deloitte is in country. We're paying for Deloitte to be there. For those of you who know the big accounting firms here in the States, Deloitte is considered to be one of our premier accounting firms. And they're auditing. They're providing reports to us. We're paying for Deloitte to be there. They're embedded in the department that Ambassador Mark Rovi used to, Oksani used to be the Minister of Finance. In fact, I met with her in, in Ukraine uh, years ago when she had that position. And as you know, Deloitte is there. And they're, they're good, and they're tough. And they're providing an accounting that I, I don't think you can find another example of that in, uh, in USAID spending or otherwise. Third, the World Bank is spending the money directly out of the state funding. So in other words, the United States taxpayer money goes to the World Bank. The World Bank then provides it for economic aid to Ukraine. Why is that important? Because they do reports periodically to us. They monitor it. Um, they're doing their own accountability measures. And it's, it's what they do um, all around the world. And I think that's very important. So there's sort of belts and suspenders here that are, that are built in. Um, and I, I think, frankly, the American people are not aware of all this. And then finally, with regard to weapons, there is something extraordinary going on with the military. Um, they call it end-use monitoring, where every single weapon that arrives in country, and in country being in Poland, primarily, some Slovakia or Romania, but the vast majority in Poland, is monitored in the sense the serial number is recorded, and then there is end-use monitoring to determine what happened to it and where it went. It's easier now that there is um, an attaché in Kyiv and the embassy there, a military attaché, to do this. This was more difficult earlier. But even there, they were getting reports back, and they insist on it. This end-use monitoring, according to both the 82nd Airborne, with whom I visited two years ago, maybe. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, not two years ago. Um, it seems like it's been two years. <laughs> uh, nine months ago, maybe, shortly after um, the second invasion, and also now with the 101st. They say it's unprecedented, and they're very serious about it. And the end-use monitoring has resulted in, as far as we can tell, and I, this is extraordinary, and frankly, I don't know that I believe it, but they tell us that not a single weapon that you as American taxpayers have provided to Ukraine has gotten into the wrong hands. Now, I, again, it, it, it will happen. But the fact that it hasn't happened, by the way, if it had happened, you'd be hearing about it from these same people who are in Congress uh, you know, questioning our, our, our policy toward Ukraine, right? You haven't heard it. So eventually, I think it will happen, of course, because this is war. But think of all the Russian equipment that the Ukrainians <laughs> have been using. Uh, sometimes repurposing it for their own purposes and fighting back against the Russians. Not a single HIMAR has been taken out, as an example. That's extraordinary to me. Uh, they do the shoot and scoot, and they must scoot very quickly. Uh, I see Wayne Jones is here, my former National Security Advisor, and he knows a lot about shooting and scooting uh, as a mm -hmm. veteran. But isn't that accurate, Wayne? Not, not, not a single HIMAR has been taken out. I mean, it's just... So to my colleagues who former colleagues, who say uh, we need more accountability, that's fine. We can tighten up all this, and we should. I'm, 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 I'm fine I'm fine to putting even more money against the IGs. But to say there's not accountability is just not fair. There's never been this kind of accountability, as far as I know. And, and I'd love to see the same accountability with some of our domestic spending in this country. <laughs> so anyway, thanks for, your, thanks for raising that, Fred, because I think it needs to be said. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Um, it, you know, it's easy to make arguments about on real politique terms and, and, and in particularly in this case on moral and very emotive terms about the need to support Ukraine. 
um, and I make them myself, and they, they resonate with me and with a lot of other people. And it's, it's easy to use those as clubs also to beat people and say, well, you know, don't ask about anything else. This is so straightforward, right and wrong. Um, but it's also true that the American taxpayer has a right to ask the question, what return concretely am I getting for the tax dollars that are being spent? And I don't ever want to suggest that that's not an appropriate question to ask and that we shouldn't have a good answer for it. So, Senator, can you help us think about how would, can we explain to the American taxpayer what value they're getting for each dollar that's going to Ukraine and possibly what cost we would have borne or would bear for not providing Ukraine with this kind of assistance? Mm -hmm. Well, this is, this is the most important question to me uh, that we'll talk about today because it has to do with ensuring that we retain the support for Ukraine during a critical time. <coughs> And I think there's a window opportunity right now uh, for us to actually increase support, which we can talk about later. And if we don't, I, I believe it's possible Russia could regain momentum. Um, so I think this is a really important question. Um, I would start by saying uh, to your comment, Fred, about um, the moral case. We shouldn't stop talking about the moral case. One of the problems is, is it's, it's left the front pages, right? So the, the evening news doesn't lead with it anymore. But the moral case is very compelling to Americans and to all of us, and that's one reason we're sitting in this room today. I mean, the torture and the killing of innocent civilians, non-combatants, uh, the war crimes that, that, that continue to be committed, both in the occupied territories, as was talked about in the last panel, uh, but the shelling of, again, apartment buildings and, and pediatric uh, you know, units and hospitals. I mean, it's just, it, we, we need to continue to talk about that and let people know what the horrors of war are about and how this totally unprovoked, totally illegal and brutal assault on Ukraine is playing out day after day. And as we sit here today in the trenches of Bakhmut, you know, these brave Ukrainian soldiers, some of whom drawn from uh, the, the ranks of civilians very recently, I mean, we need to know about that. We need to see it and hear it and feel it and touch it. So I'm not against continuing to talk about what's happening that we should. That message needs to be delivered clearly. And I think Americans, care about that. I think we're moral people. But second, we've got to shift then to the national security argument. That This is in our American national security. As much as we love the people of Ukraine who turned to us in 2014, by the way, as well as the EU, to say we want to be free, we want to be a democracy, we want to have free markets, we want to have transparency, that's all important. But this is in our interest too. Even if Ukraine was not a great ally of ours, even if we hadn't signed the memorandum and Istanbul in 1994, saying we're going to protect your territorial integrity, which we did, by the way. Um, and why? I mean, it's very simple. If we had not acted, and again, my view, without American leadership, Ukraine would not have been able to protect itself against this onslaught. If we had not acted, where would we be today? We would have a Europe that would be incredibly unstable. Um, we would be practicing, in my view, Fortress Europe right now. In other words, we'd have American troops and American equipment all along the border. I don't know if there's a map you can put up that shows the four NATO countries for which we have an Article 5 obligation who would suddenly have a border with Russia. Can that map? We'll, we'll work on it. Okay. I mean, you know, th this would be, this would be a, a time when America would be asked to step forward to respond to what would be viewed as a real threat to, to Europe, even if Putin hadn't said repeatedly, this is not just about Ukraine, which he has. This is about recreating either the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union or some other grandiose scheme. So this is in our national interest and in our national security. There, if you look at, uh, and Natalia, I think, may talk about this later, uh, but she has a, a, a very interesting perspective on you know, our national defense strategy has listed Russia as, as a threat and an adversary and an enemy. So it's, it's not like it started with this, this assault. I mean, they were already there. And here they would be on the borders of so many of our NATO allies. So it would be an enormous expense for the American taxpayer. And I think we have to think about that. What is the alternative? So our national security is directly affected. Finally, I would just say the obvious, which is it impacts the entire world. People say, well, the, the, the new world order has been dismembered. 
Yeah, that's a bad thing because the New World Order kept the peace virtually, certainly did in, in Europe for almost 80 years. But it's, it's more than that. It's about the fact that every other country in the world, particularly those countries who are free democracies, who are looking at the possibility of an autocratic regime attacking it, whether it's North Korea or whether it's Iran or, or whether it's Russia or whether it's another country, and I'll, I'll throw China in there, um, what are they going to do? They're going to look at this and say, okay, the U.S. didn't step up, the alliance didn't step up, so we're on our own, right? We're on our own. And that means you do what? You arm to the teeth. Some will go for nuclear weapons immediately. Some have the capability of doing that, but others will just... It would be great for the defense industry around the world because everyone will arm up. It becomes a much more dangerous and volatile world immediately. That's not in our national security interest. So I would just say um, we've got to make these points and make them clearly, and I think the alternative is one that people who are against this need to, need to answer. And, you know... Maybe they have a different answer. Maybe they think somehow everything would have been fine. I saw someone said recently, we need to de-escalate because that will get Putin to the bargaining table. What proof is there of that? Whether it's the history that Leon has laid out or whether it's what we all see just through common sense, the only way to get him to talk is obviously by winning on the battlefield and by tightening the sanctions. And even there, I'm not sure it happens, as I said earlier. So the alternative there is to win. To be able to win means to be able to push him out of these parts of, of Ukraine that uh, are currently occupied, um, and then be able to tell the rest of the world, you know what, we are going to establish some teeth behind this so-called world order that we've talked about. And we are going to protect freedom and democracy. Thank you, Senator. Um, it's an excellent point to remind everyone we've, you know, NATO and U.S. European Command have war plans for dealing with the Russian invasion. Um, I think George made the point uh, earlier in the previous panel. There are 200,000 Russian troops that will not be participating in that invasion uh, because the Ukrainians have removed them permanently from the battlefield. There are 2,000, 200,000 Russian troops, rather. There are 2,000 Russian tanks that will not be participating um, that doesn't mean the Russian threat is removed, of course, because the Russians will rebuild. But it's a huge damage that has been done to the Russian war machine with none of it occurring on NATO soil. And I think the point you make about exactly how many states would we like to have borders with the reviving Russian enemy and exactly how many borders with Russia would we like to have to defend is an excellent uh, point for us to reflect on. You mentioned the, the need to uh, increase support for this effort. Do you see a kind of an argument or a better argument to make to the American people about how to do that? Well, I think what the American people want to see is a strategy for victory. And uh, I think when I'm home talking to people, you know, I do see some, as I mentioned earlier, Ukraine fatigue. And we have to acknowledge that fatigue and, and understand that these costs are significant. Uh, everything we said earlier, I think, is true. Uh, in terms of how you talk about this issue, the moral case, the national security, and so on. Um, but I, I also think there's another issue that is important. Most Democrats and Republicans acknowledge that China creates a larger long-term threat to the United States. Um, and partly it's just the size of the, their military, their economy, uh, their ability to project force. Um, think about it this way. If the argument is we need to stop supporting Ukraine because we need to train our thoughts uh, and our efforts on China and what's happening in the Indo-Pacific particularly, what would happen if we were to do that, if we were to pull back? If we were to say, this isn't important, what's really important is China. Um, Ukraine does fall, in my view. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe the uh, Ukrainians without our support, um, and I think without our support means coalition support, would, would be able to survive, but I don't think so. Then we are required to focus on what? Putin, Russia. I mean, we have no choice, right? That becomes, and that distracts us even further from, from China. 
And remember, we haven't put a single U.S. serviceman or woman in harm's way. And that's nothing to remind the American people who somehow view this, some of them, like Afghanistan or Iraq. It's entirely different. These are Ukrainians willing to fight and die for their own country. It's providing them the tools to do that. But if we were to allow this to happen, if I talked about Fortress Europe, we would be focusing a lot more on Russia to the detriment of what I do agree is true, which is that we need to focus a lot on China as well, hopefully to avoid any conflict with China ever, but to be able to project force and have the capability to ensure that we can keep the peace. So to me, that, that's part of the answer as well. And because uh, I do think a lot of Americans are susceptible to this argument that you know, China is our real problem. Why are we spending time on Russia? That's, a, that's a, such an excellent and important uh, point to make, Senator, that there's nothing that would benefit Xi Jinping more than, on the one hand, Putin being successful in his efforts to destroy NATO. And you're right to remind us that Putin's initial ultimata, the conditions that he had delivered in December uh, that formed the basis of the ultimatum before the invasion, were primarily about the destruction of NATO. They were only secondarily about Ukraine. Um, if he were to succeed in that objective, of course, or weakening that, no one would benefit more than he, but right after him, Xi Jinping uh, himself. And of course, as I've been speaking with my colleague uh, Dan Blumenthal here about, you know, are we entering a Cold War 2.0? We, we may well be, and in, except one in which the roles are reversed, that uh, Putin, Russia plays the role of China in this Cold War of distracting and tying down huge elements of American uh, national power while she gets to run amok in Asia. That won't happen if Putin is defeated. That won't happen if Ukraine is able to build a strong, be a strong defensive glacis for NATO. It will happen if we allow Putin to continue to drag us through a protracted conflict that with ever frozen and unfrozen uh, war zone in Ukraine and so forth, and inching ever closer toward the NATO borders. That will serve Xi incredibly well. And it's one of the reasons why, if we really care about being able to pivot to China, the way to do that is to win rapidly in Ukraine. Frank, can I just say Please. one thing on that? Win rapidly, uh, I think, means changing our strategy. Um, I, was, I did a TV interview earlier today, and someone said, how would you grade the administration and the alliance? Uh, and I said, we need to have our A game here. I mean, there's only one choice, and, and we're not there. Maybe a B, maybe a B plus. And I applaud all the administration has done and all that the American people have supported. But we have to take advantage of this window of opportunity I talked about earlier, which is the spring offensive. And darn it, we need to provide what they have told us repeatedly that they need. Longer range artillery is, I think, maybe the single most important thing because the Russian, as you know, the, the depots and the logistics have moved back just beyond the range of, of where the Ukrainian missiles are able to hit. They're very smart, of course. Uh, we've got to do what we did initially, as was noted earlier, with regard to the HIMARS and uh, how that was so effective in Kherson. And softening it up, we've got to do that. We have to provide aircraft, in my view. And I know that's a very controversial issue. I've been supporting this for a long time because the Ukrainians have told me that, that this is very important to them, and I believe it is. And yes, they do not have air superiority in Ukraine, but they do have the ability to continue, continue to bomb and uh, attack these civilian sites, and they're doing it uh, without consequence. So the F-16s, it's a matter of the United States saying our export controls are going to be relaxed. We'll allow other countries to provide them. I mean, I'm not even suggesting that we provide them directly, but there are plenty of other countries and, um, that, are, that are willing to do so. The tanks, these battle tanks need to get in place now. So the fact that somehow the, uh, the Leopard 2s are not in country it drives me crazy. There's 2,000 of them in, in, in Europe. Um, let's provide 5% of them, 10% of them, it would make a huge difference. Let's get these Abrams there and get them working. The Ukrainians are pretty darn smart. You know, they've shown themselves to be able to figure out uh, how to drive a tank. And I know it's a complicated <laughs> thing because they're made in Ohio, and, and I love them. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> I have been in one a few times. I haven't driven it, actually, but I, I pretended like I was. But um, this would make a huge difference, Fred, right now. Just, just those three things. There are other things, anti-aircraft weapons and, and certain kinds of munitions. And this cluster bomb issue is something we need to discuss as well. The Russians have been using them consistently against the Ukrainians. And we have lots in our stockpile, and yet we can't provide any of those. Not based on a treaty obligation, but based on the decision by the administration. So again, I applaud what they have done. I've tried to work with the administration, as you know, over time, and I'll continue to be supportive when they make decisions that are positive. And they just made another announcement today that was positive. But we've got to take that next step toward what they really need to be able to turn the tide. Right now, we are funding Ukraine so that it can defend itself in a static condition. We need to fund Ukraine so that they can claim victory and that all of us can move on to a, you know, a better situation where we're rebuilding Ukraine rather than defending Ukraine. Thank you, Senator. So we have a few, uh, a few questions from the audience. And um, we obviously have a lim limited time, but please uh, send uh, your questions to uh, uh, Jacqueline, uh, Jacqueline's email. Um, a couple of the questions relate to Crimea, and this is this is a very uh, this is an issue that we're making very thorny. Um, and a, a, before I get to the questions, I want to make an observation about Crimea itself, because we, in our discourse, we continue to treat Crimea as separate from the rest of occupied Ukraine, um, and I will submit that we should not, um, because Putin's arguments about the legitimacy or lack thereof of the Khrushchev's transferring of Crimea to the Russian Soviet Federated Socialist Republic in the 50s uh, become relevant only if you think that asserting a historic right based on ethnicity or something else to a territory justifies you in demanding that territory be given to you, in which case I don't know what we're even talking about because Putin claims all of Ukraine on that basis. Um, but we, that argument all has the problem that Russia recognized Crimea as part of Ukraine not once but twice. The Russian Federation, during the breakup of the Soviet Union, recognized Ukraine in its borders, including Crimea, and then again even more explicitly in the 1994 Budapest Memorandum that the Senator alluded to, in return for Ukraine giving up its Soviet-era nuclear arsenal, Russia guaranteed Ukraine's territorial integrity as it then was, which included Crimea. So you can't have a more explicit statement from Russia of having ceded its actual legal rights to Crimea. And so this continued discourse that we're having about how Crimea is somehow special and only sort of Ukraine is extremely problematic. And we really we, we need to reflect on that. Nevertheless, there are things about Crimea that make it unusual. Um, it certainly is very important to Putin. And so I think it's reasonable to ask questions uh, like those that a, a couple of members of the audience have posed. First of all, how would the civilian population of Crimea react uh, to Ukraine regaining control over the territory? I think that's, that's an interesting uh, question to discuss. And then secondly, why has the Biden administration been so hesitant in outwardly supporting an offensive to liberate Crimea? I offer that to anyone on the panel who wants to address. Uh, if, I, if I may say, uh, I just remember the, the uh, uh, the late and much missed um, leader of um, uh, uh, Russian Democratic Forces, Boris Nemtsov, um, um, uh, once, uh, literally days after after the uh, annexation of Crimea, um, completely uh, 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 negated this this myth. He said, or or the basis of of, of uh, uh, Putin's annexation. Remember, the idea was that oh, you know, that now that now that um, you know the Nazis took over in Kiev, um, the Ukrainian population is, is, is uh, sorry, the Russian, the ethnic Russians in Ukraine are in danger, and they had been suffering before. And, and, and Nemtsov said uh, there, are only, there were only two, two Ukrainian language schools in the entire Crimea, the rest were Russian schools. Uh, the, the Ukrainian, you know, the, the, the government in Kiev let the ethnic Russians in Ukraine essentially to run Crimea. I mean, they were the majority in the local parliament. They were the uh, uh, 
you know, um, local authorities everywhere. So frankly, uh, you know, I, I would say, you know, once all this, this frenzy and all these lies are removed, I believe that, you know, the return to the status quo pre-war is, is, is a normal thing. Wayne, very quickly, um, it's obviously very difficult to assess what a population living under a brutal autocracy are really thinking yes. about you know the the governance of the of the country. But but I guess the closest sense of that we can we can get is, is by looking to the pre twenty fourteen status quo ante. And yes, Crimea had a handful of separatist political parties that were polling at very low numbers. Uh, Crimea, I mean, had a referendum at some point about being part of Ukraine in which the pro-Ukraine side won a comfortable majority. So, so, so all of those data points should direct us to the conclusion that um, the interpretation given by the Russian side back in 2014 for annexing Crimea was completely bogus. And, and there was no, certainly no sort of homegrown independence movement. Uh, if there were, there wouldn't be little green men seizing government buildings uh, at five in the morning. I think one might add to that, and I agree, I agree of course, with, with all of that. Um, if you look at the population of Crimea, the population of Crimea is, of course, not homogeneous, never has been is quite complicated, it includes a significant population of Crimean Tatars um, who have historically been extraordinarily unenthusiastic about being subject to the Russian Federation, <laughs> under which they were actively persecuted uh, in really extreme fashion. Um, so there is very likely a, a sizable population in Crimea <clears throat> that would very much like to be liberated uh, from the restoration of the Russian yoke. Um, beyond that, the population includes, there is, of course, the Russian naval base. The headquarters of the Black Sea Fleet is in Sevastopol. And so part of the population consists of Russians who are associated with the naval base. Well, one presumes that they will leave one way or another. Um, I doubt that the Russian military personnel and their family families will uh, hang around while this is going on. And, of course, unlike Russia, Ukraine allows people to leave. So I suspect that we would see the elements of the Russian military and their families actually depart. What I'm more concerned about is the ethnic cleansing campaign that uh, Lena spoke about on the previous panel and the fact that the Russians have been deliberately moving large numbers of Ukrainian civilians out of Ukrainian territory into Russia and bringing Russians in to replace them. That population transfer is something that I think we should be alarmed about. It will pose problems for Ukraine uh, as it liberates its territory. Again, I think the Ukrainians will be perfectly happy to allow Russians who have been settled in Ukrainian territory to leave if they choose. Will the Russians allow the Ukrainians they have illegally deported to return? And as we think about war conflict resolution, the question of the fate of the number that I won't even estimate of Ukrainians who have been involuntarily deported to Russia is something that I think is very important for us not to lose sight of. Um, we have in last, uh, another question, which I think will serve as, a, as an excellent uh, final set of reflections for us, turning back to Russia and the view from the Kremlin. What, is the, what do we think is the view from the Kremlin? What messages do you think Putin is receiving from, on the one hand, we have, you know, Polish MiGs, maybe. We have German Leopards. I, I think four Leopards actually made it into Ukraine. I thought I saw it today. We have the, the F-16s discussion and so forth. But does NATO look united? We came out of the Munich Security Conference, and we had lots of great statements about how we're all in there for as long as necessary. Does it look that way to Putin? Natalia, what do, you, what do you think? Yeah, I can start this off. A um, couple of things. One, I don't think that Putin has, um, and the Kremlin have fixed the intelligence failure problem that they had in the first place. Um, 
you know, we actually look back to 2014, right, when they tried to um, take actually a lot more than portions of two regions of Ukraine, and they've uh, misunderstood, uh, miscalculated um, their own capabilities as well as the sentiment of the local population. <coughs> and, you know, I thought, for example, that after eight years um, of both uh, Ukraine openly shoring up defenses and, and West supporting it, uh, Russia would have had the better assessment of their, what they were facing in February of last year. Then over the past months, we've seen um, actually repeated uh, um, cases of these intelligence failures in different scale of Russia under, uh, overestimating its capabilities, underestimating Western support. Um, and I think the system that actually preserves Putin's regime is antithetical uh, to truth in many ways. And it's, preserve, uh, it's actually preventing uh, the truth and the true ground um, picture um, from eliminated to the top. And I think it has also to, go, uh, to do with the Western support. Um, I would expect that a lot of his um, advisors are telling him that no, actually, um, West is on the brink of uh, stopping its support to Ukraine, and you know, the weapons are actually not making that kind of difference. And we've seen that in, in their public discussions, there's this constant trend to constantly minimize the importance of Western support. Uh, and when there are um, rare exceptions of military bloggers that uh, Katerina uh, Stepanenko is watching that come out against that and actually say no, uh, Western support is making a difference, they're often being shut down. So I think, um, I'm sure he's more cognizant uh, of Western support than he was a year ago, but I think the, uh, the systemic issues that are leading to these intelligence failures will continue. Uh, just, just one, uh, I guess, a comment in the form of a question. Uh, do we know of an authoritarian leader in power for 23 years whose aides give him what <laughs> is true rather than what he wants to see? Um, and, and again and again and again, um, out of that black box of the Kremlin, we hear that no, they, 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 whatever he believes, they, that, that's, the, that's the job of, uh, of his intelligence. And uh, uh, well, we saw it, of course, in Ukraine, um, a complete failure of, uh, uh, of informing him of what the real situation is. But I think it continues. I think Natalia is, is absolutely right. That's it. I mean, I, I think uh, these guys are the experts on Putin and his thinking in our previous panel. It was fascinating, sort of the, the psychoanalysis uh, of him. I, I mean, none of this makes sense to most of us. This is just illogical what he's done. It's a huge error. But I think at this point, he believes that the patience of the alliance will not last as long as his missiles and his people, his soldiers. And I think Iran, um, and God forbid if China makes this decision, has helped him think that way because he thinks he can continue, whether it's North Korea or Iran, or again, God forbid China provides him with these weapons. You know, he's, as was said earlier, uh, Leon, you talked about a dictator's uh, best environment is the war. environment of war, yeah. a war president. And so he thinks our patience is wearing thin and that it will be possible for him to outlast it. That's why I think we need to redouble our effort right, right now. And if we redouble our effort, it doesn't have to be the long war. Um, it, would take a, it would take a serious commitment by everybody, including our allies, not just the United States, but a more serious effort to get beyond this notion of um, you know, what is escalatory and what is not. There's no way to to look at this situation logically and not say that Russia just continues to escalate no matter what and has from the start. I think this is a, there's a very important point here for the administration and for, well, particularly for the administration to reflect on because the administration is constantly sending out messages that are directed at Putin one way and another. And if you think about it for a minute and you realize the kind of confirmation bias that exists in the Kremlin, that clearly exists in the Kremlin, is demonstrable. And you can see it even when we get these reports from insiders about how it's working. Putin is suffering from a massive confirmation bias. What does that mean? It means that when you're presented with evidence on the one hand that supports the conclusion you desire, and on the other hand that undermines it, you favor, you preference the evidence that supports the conclusion you want to come to. 
when you have a leader who is engaging in suffering as badly from confirmation bias as it seems that Putin really is, messaging has to be tailored in that fashion. And I don't think, this is one of the things that I, I would say the White House has been not doing right. And I so, will say that very unequivocally because it, 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 the, I think there is an attempt to balance the strong statements that the White House makes about our commitment to Ukraine and, and we will stand with Ukraine and what the Russians have done is evil and so forth. And all of that messaging is there and it's great and it's very important. But then various members of the administration at different times attempt to balance it with comments about how we think the Ukrainians should be more willing to negotiate. We, we, you know, we're hesitant to get after supporting the Russians in Crimea. We're worried about the Russian red lines. We're not sure that we continue to, the, the terrible leak that was made uh, some weeks ago about how we're, we, we can't do this forever from an administration official. I don't think that the administration understands that in an environment of confirmation bias as heavy as that that certainly exists in the Kremlin, those things, those statements will be heavily preferenced in Putin's mind and by Putin's advisors over, all, over the much larger and louder noise that we're making about how supportive we are of Ukraine. And so I think that we, the, there is some calibration that the White House would be advised to consider in the, exactly what message we want to get to Putin and how important it is to make sure that we can find a way to pierce that confirmation bias and get Putin to understand what I actually believe is true, which is that Western support for Ukraine and against this aggression will outlast Putin's ability to continue to fight this war. I believe that that is true. I'm confident that it can be true. But I think one of the challenges, we want to know how do we end this war? We end this war either, as Natalia says, by destroying Putin's ability to continue to fight it, which the Ukrainians are doing with our help, or, and in addition, by persuading Putin of the truth of this statement. And I think that we really have to think a little bit more about how, how to do that. I'm very grateful to all of you uh, who have joined us here uh, for several hours.